I remember when I was a kid going outside and looking up at the stars and going, wow, I wonder what's out there. And you watch science fiction on TV, which is really just people wondering what's out there and coming up with ideas for what it is. Hubble is a tool that can take you out there to those distant galaxies, those pictures that come back. I wonder what's out there. Hey, here's a picture of something that's out there. Wow, that's amazing. I'm not an astronomer, but I can tell you that whenever I talk to people, they've, everyone has heard of the Hubble Space Telescope and seen the images that have come back from some of the instruments and are fascinated by what they see in those images, not only because they're beautiful, but also because of the questions that are asked and also answered by looking at these images. Well, it's been important for, not just for astronomy, but for physics. I mean, they're really rewriting the physics books. I mean, the physics books that we had <laughs> back in high school, I mean, they're literally being rewritten from the, uh, the things that they've learned from, from Hubble. The Hubble Space Telescope is more than remarkable. It has produced all of the science that we expected it would. The discovery that black holes really do exist and occupy the center of nearly every galaxy, massive black holes, millions of times the mass of our sun. It's measured the age of the universe, 13.7 plus or minus 0.1 billion years old. Very accurate number. It's answered just so many of those fundamental questions that people have been asking about the cosmos uh, since people were able to ask questions. With the launch of STS-125, Space Shuttle Atlantis and its seven-member crew are on a mission to once again push the boundaries of how deep into space and far back in time humanity can see. It is a flight to upgrade what already may be the most significant scientific instrument ever launched. And for the Space Shuttle, it is a final visit to an old friend. STS-125 will be the last mission to the Hubble Space Telescope. With almost two decades of historic and trailblazing science already accomplished, Hubble will be reborn with servicing mission four. Over 11 days and five spacewalks, astronauts will deliver new cutting-edge science instruments to Hubble along with gyroscopes, batteries, and other components crucial for the telescope's continued success through the year 2013. The spacewalks will include the replacement of a crucial science computer that failed just two weeks before the original STS-125 launch date in October 2008. This failure caused the mission to be delayed while scientists and mission managers work to add a replacement part and repair activities to the mission manifest. The crew of Atlantis is a mix of experienced astronauts and first-time space travelers, including several who are making return trips to the orbiting telescope. Scott Altman will serve as Atlantis's commander on this historic mission to Hubble. Altman commanded the STS-109 Hubble servicing mission in 2002 and flew as the pilot on two other shuttle missions, STS-90 and STS-106. Navy Reserve Captain Greg Johnson will make his first voyage into space as the pilot of Atlantis. Johnson is a former Navy test pilot and NASA research pilot. Mission specialist Mike Good will also be making his first space flight. Good, who is an Air Force colonel with more than 2,100 hours in 30 different types of aircraft, will serve as Mission Specialist 1 and will conduct a pair of spacewalks. Megan MacArthur will make her first flight into space aboard Atlantis as Mission Specialist 2. She will act as the lead operator of the shuttle's robotic arm, capturing Hubble once Atlantis catches up to the telescope. She will also operate the arm during nearly all of the mission spacewalks. Mission Specialist 3, John Grunsfeld, an astronomer, will be making his third trip to Hubble and his fifth space flight. Grunsfeld is an experienced spacewalker with a total of five spacewalks to service the telescope during STS-103 in 1999 and STS-109 in 2002. He will add three more spacewalks to his log during STS-125. Mission Specialist 4 is Mike Massimino, a native of Franklin Square, New York. Massimino will also make his second trip to space and second visit to Hubble with a pair of spacewalks. First-time space traveler Drew Feustel rounds out the STS-125 crew as Mission Specialist 5. 
Boistel is one of the four spacewalkers who will venture into Atlantis' payload bay to repair the space telescope. Well, this is the fifth servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope, and what we're going to do is basically extend the life of the telescope for another few years, another five years at least, hopefully, and uh, we're also going to repair and upgrade some of the instruments on board the telescope. And uh, the way we're going to do that is by capturing the telescope and placing it in the shuttle's payload bay. And then some of our crew members will do five different spacewalks to do this repair and upgrade work. The crew of Atlantis will install two new instruments during those five spacewalks. The Cosmic Origin Spectrograph and the Wide Field Camera 3. The Cosmic Origin Spectrograph will allow researchers to explore the cosmic web in extreme ultraviolet frequencies. The Cosmic Origin Spectrograph replaces COSTAR, the corrective optics package that was installed during STS-61 to remedy the spherical aberration discovered after the telescope was launched in 1990. The Wide Field Camera 3 will allow the telescope to see across the light spectrum from ultraviolet to optical to infrared. Imagine what kind of digital camera you could buy in 1990. Well, you couldn't. They weren't on the market yet. Well, nowadays, of course, you can go out and buy phenomenal cameras, and the astronomy community can create even better cameras for astronomical research. The spacewalking astronauts will also work to perform the first on-orbit repair of existing instruments that have degraded or failed, including the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph and the advanced camera for surveys, which produce many of Hubble's most dramatic images. In order to allow those instruments to operate, the crew of STS-125 will need to perform some routine maintenance, similar to servicing a car on Earth. That service will include replacing six large batteries that power the telescope. The batteries are charged by the telescope's large solar arrays. The astronauts will install new rate sensor units that house Hubble's gyroscopes. These gyros are used to point the telescope with a very high level of precision. They will also install new thermal blankets to help protect the instrument from the dramatic temperature swings as the telescope is exposed to the frigid cold of darkness and the intense heat of daylight. The spacewalks to repair and refurbish Hubble will be very different from the spacewalks conducted to build the International Space Station, which often include maneuvering large sections of the complex into place. Hubble spacewalks have been compared to performing surgery rather than doing construction, with the astronauts working in a surgical suite performing highly dexterous work as the telescope is berthed on a rotating platform akin to a lazy Susan at the rear of Atlantis's cargo bay. During the first spacewalk, astronauts Grunsfeld and Feustel will replace a critical piece of equipment, the Science Instrument Command and Data Handling Unit. The new unit will replace the one that stopped working in September 2008, delaying the service mission for several months. As we got to two weeks out, we got the word that on orbit, uh, a box, a series of boxes actually, in the way that the scientific data comes down to the ground had failed. Its primary site had been working for 18 years, but that channel failed, and uh, so NASA switched over to the other side, a side B from side A, and eventually was able to start getting data down again, but then we were presented with a problem. Should we fly and do the repairs to a telescope that now only had one way of getting data down to the ground, and if that failed, the telescope wouldn't be able to do science anymore. If that goes out, now none of those scientific discoveries, none of that, those pictures of galaxies are able to get through and come down to the ground. So uh, we're going to go up there with a new box that will have a new A and B side. So it'll have redundancy and hopefully the, both channels will be working and uh, the, we'll be able to leave it there with uh, the confidence that in case this problem happens again, we won't be out of luck. They'll still have a, a backup channel for it. Many of the instruments on Hubble were not designed to be repaired in space. In fact, they were specifically designed not to come apart. Repairing these delicate instruments won't be easy. The repair of the spectrograph, for instance, requires the spacewalkers to remove more than 100 screws to access a computer card they will pull out and replace. 
you know, we have a team of engineering experts that have come up with an ingenious solution to this problem, but the crew members are basically, you know, inside the telescope removing these hundred tiny screws in order to get at a circuit card um, in this in these instruments and and then replace it. And so um, it requires a lot of very fine motor skills on their part, and of course they're wearing these big oven mitts on their hands, which makes it very challenging. The Hubble spacewalks won't be the only things that differ from missions to the space station. Without the station crew to give the shuttle a once-over and photograph its heat shield, the customary survey of the heat shield done the day after launch will be much more intensive. The crew will use the shuttle robotic arm and its 50-foot boom extension and sensor systems to perform not only the standard nose and wing edges inspection, but also a survey of the upper crew cabin and the entire underside of the shuttle. In the unlikely event that irreparable damage is found, the crew won't be able to get to the space station to wait for a ride home. Atlantis can't reach the station from Hubble's orbit. So we will shelter in place on our orbiter, power down to extend the life, the oxygen supplies that we have, the CO2 removal systems, and we can go up to roughly 25 days waiting for somebody to come up to us. For STS-125, another shuttle will be standing ready on Kennedy Space Center's launch pad 39B. If needed, Space Shuttle Endeavour, manned by four of the astronauts from the STS-126 mission that flew in November 2008, will be ready to launch and retrieve Atlantis's crew within days. Two shuttles would uh, kind of rendezvous, and since we don't have a docking system, we're going to use the arm and attach an arm from one to the other and sort of fly close formation and then slide up and down the arm, making the transfers of the crew between the two vehicles. Once Atlantis is cleared for landing, Endeavour will be moved from launch pad 39B to adjacent launch pad 39A to begin preparations for its launch on an assembly mission to the International Space Station. The Hubble Space Telescope doesn't make discoveries. People make discoveries. And the Hubble is the ultimate team machine. Just to be able to go service the Hubble Space Telescope, we need seven astronauts and a space shuttle. And that space shuttle needs tens of thousands of people all to do their job right before it can successfully get to Hubble. And it's an amazing group of people, so enthusiastic, so excited that we're doing this mission. And when I've met some of these people and they tell me their stories about how for 20 years they've been part of this project practically, it's amazing and it, it's very exciting and you want to do your best work to help, you know, these people with the dream that they've been working on for 20 years. It's an amazing group of people. When you look at that whole ensemble of, of the team, uh, I think it's something that this country should be very proud of.
Hang on, Dad. Hang on, Dad. <laughs> Good job, Dad. 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 Good job,
At Cape Canaveral, Space Shuttle Atlantis is poised for a unique billion-dollar mission, and the crew of seven will face an exceptional challenge. In orbit, the aging Hubble telescope is badly in need of repairs, the only solution to send astronauts with a new kit of parts to fix it. This is a model of the Hubble telescope at the Science Museum in London. The real thing is five times that size. And some say this attempt to repair it in space is NASA's most dangerous shuttle mission ever. The plan is to fit new instruments and repair others in orbit for the first time. There'll be a new camera and a fresh set of batteries. Five hazardous spacewalks are needed in all. And the mission was originally deemed so risky it was cancelled. This mission is particularly dangerous because it's actually nowhere near the space station. So if anything goes wrong, there's no way that the mission can be rescued other than launching another space shuttle. So the Endeavour is ready and waiting if something goes wrong. The telescopes provided unprecedented views of the cosmos for almost two decades. If the mission succeeds, it should send back more spectacular postcards from space for another five to ten years. Christine McGurty, BBC News. Stuff just hours from now, we explore the mission to upgrade the Hubble Space Telescope, something that has brought us some amazing images over the years. And Christopher Smith here in the World Weather Center, where we're continuing to monitor the possibility for some severe weather as we go across parts of Europe as we go throughout the day today. Could we see more scenes that look like this? Big time flooding across Switzerland. We'll have all the details with your forecast coming up. It's going to be a cosmic grand finale, an 11-day mission to fix the Hubble telescope that had been scheduled for back in 2004. Here is why Hubble matters. Pictures that take us to the edge of the universe, to faraway galaxies, a look back at time and into black holes all snapped by the world's most famous telescope, the Hubble. But it needs to be fixed. And lift off of Space Shuttle Atlantis. Seven astronauts will blast off to do surgery in space, fix instruments, replacing broken cameras, batteries to keep Hubble going. It's the final and most dangerous mission, five spacewalks in five days. Astronauts could get hit by space junk, and any rescue will be tough. This glimmering jewel is nearly as big as a school bus. It circled Earth more than 100,000 times and logged almost 3 billion miles. The astronauts say it's worth risking their lives and that Hubble needs a hug to keep cosmic pictures like these beaming back to Earth. This time, two space shuttles are going to be on the pad at the same time. Space Shuttle Atlantis is going to be on one pad. That's going to be for the Hubble trip. And then you've got Endeavour that's going to be on another pad in case they have to send it up for a rescue mission. The reason they have to do that is that the International Space Station is completely in another orbit, and it's too far for the astronauts to go to for safety. Let's take a look at the global weather forecast now. Chris Smith is at the Weather Center. I hope the weather holds up there over at Kennedy Space Center today it needs to blast off well I'm, I think it actually will I mean as far as the weather is concerned now if there's a mechanical problem and they have to delay it then the weather doesn't become as favorable as we go through the next few days and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about today we're expecting about 28 degrees winds uh, should be fairly light 25 kilometers per hour but what I want you to notice as we go into Tuesday and Wednesday we begin to see the possibility for some showers popping up across the peninsula of Florida, and that would make things problematic for launching. So we're hopeful that no mechanical problems today because the weather looks picture perfect for launch at 2.01 this afternoon local time on the east. Days. Meanwhile, across Europe, we're seeing storm system after storm system making its way across the continent. There's one storm system right there, one there to the south across southern Europe, 
beautiful weather, warm and dry. Meanwhile, kind of cool and showery with some pretty big th showers and thunderstorms across some of the area. You'll see a threat for severe weather today, stretching all the way from the Iberian Peninsula through western parts of France, back over through the Alps and into eastern Europe as we go throughout the day today. So we could see more pictures like this out of Lisbon, Portugal over the weekend where we saw some big rain there delaying the tennis match. Zwar einmal. Jetzt brechen US-Astronauten ein letztes Mal zum Weltraumteleskop Hubble auf, um das empfindliche Gerät in Schuss zu halten. In einigen Jahren wird Houston das Superauge ins All durch ein neues Gerät ersetzen. Bis dahin soll Hubble durchhalten. Mehr über den ungewöhnlichsten Kundendienst der Milchstraße von Micklocher. Das Hubble-Teleskop. Seit drei Jahren ist das Superfernrohr in der Umlaufbahn nur noch beschränkt einsatzfähig. Zur letzten Rundum-Erneuerung hebt nun am Montag die Atlantis-Raumfähre in Florida ab. Elf Tage dauert die Mission der sieben Astronauten in 600 Kilometer Höhe fernab der Raumstation. Die Atlantis-Besatzung wird den Schulbus großen Späher einfangen und in der Ladebucht reparieren. Danach soll Hubble endlich wieder gut sehen können. Es ist cool für uns, hier in Cape Canaveral zu sein. Wir haben zweieinhalb Jahre für den Einsatz trainiert. Wir freuen uns auf die Arbeit am Hubble. Die 1 Milliarde Dollar Mission gilt als riskant. Die Spezialisten sprechen von einer Gehirnoperation im All. Die Astronauten müssen dazu in der Schwerelosigkeit mit 100 Schrauben hantieren. Für den Fall, dass die Atlantis etwa wegen Problemen mit dem Hitzeschild nicht zurückkehren kann, steht erstmal seine zweite Fähre für den Notfall startklar bereit. Die Endeavour müsste die Kollegen dann evakuieren. Klappt alles, soll Hubble bis 2014 das Weltall beobachten. Schon und Zuschauer haben wir jetzt auch ins Studio eingeladen. Ich stelle mir das jetzt so vor, ähm, Putzhandschuh, klar, Lappen, ein bisschen Glas rein hier und dann wird die Linse geputzt. Oder wie läuft Ungefähr das so machst du das zu Hause, aber da oben Weltall <lacht> sieht es ein bisschen anders aus, denn es äh, sind ja doch 600 Kilometer über der Erde, wo sich hier dieses äh, Weltraumteleskop befindet, genauer gesagt 600 Kilometer über dem Äquator und da saust es ständig rum. Wenn die Aktion jetzt also in vier Tagen dann losgeht, vier Tage braucht das Space Shuttle, um überhaupt hinzukommen, dann wird das Space Shuttle die Ladebucht öffnen und mit dem Kran erstmal hier dieses Riesending einfangen. Das ist ja so groß wie ein Schulbus, 13 Meter hoch, 4 Meter breit. Und es ist äußerst kitzlich, dieses Monstrum dann hier in die Ladebucht zu, zu hieven, wo dann die Arbeit losgeht. Eine komplexe Angelegenheit, die Astronauten sprechen ja von einer Gehirnoperation. Sie haben zweieinhalb Jahre darauf gewartet. Sie werden dann hier auf diesem Kranausleger zum Teil stehen, um überhaupt an, die, an den Maschinenpark des defekten oder nicht mehr perfekt arbeitenden Hubble-Teleskops ranzukommen. Und das ist schon sehr, sehr schwierig. Also man rechnet vier Ausstiege a äh, sieben Stunden, um überhaupt dieses äh, Teleskop wieder scharf zu stellen. Und äh, das ist eine Heidenarbeit und das ist auch sehr, sehr schwierig, weil dieses Space Shuttle, wenn es dann äh, hier im Weltall ist, nicht mehr gerettet werden kann durch die ISS. Also wenn das Space Shuttle da oben ist, bleibt es dann dort und es müsste eine zweite Raumfähre kommen, um es dann zu evakuieren, falls es Schwierigkeiten gibt. Also mit anderen Worten, man hat also einen möglichen Fehlschlag einkalkuliert. Man kann es nie ausschließen, die Atlantis startet ja heute Abend und wenn sie dann dort oben in vier Tagen ankommt, wird es keine Raumstation geben, die gucken kann, ist der Hitzeschild in Ordnung, ist er nicht in Ordnung. Das muss die Besatzung dann selbst durchführen, aber das, wenn das alles klappt, dann sieht das Hubble-Teleskop dann wieder solche schicken Sachen wie Exoplaneten, also erdähnliche Planeten, die andere Sonnen umkreisen und sie wird 12 Milliarden Lichtjahre weit ins All zurück oder hineinschauen können. Aber das setzt voraus, dass die neue Kamera, die jetzt hier installiert wird, dass die dann auch funktioniert. Mick Locher, danke schön. Delicate area of the telescope. So we open up these big doors and then we're going to have to kind of fish me inside of this, uh, inside of the telescope. I've got to act like a statue. <laughs> and I'm a fairly big statue as far as astronauts go. Now, more on, the, uh, on some of the spectacular images captured by the Hubble telescope. This is a red dust ring that surrounds a star at the center of the image. This uh, fantasy-like landscape is one of the largest panoramic images ever taken. It shows a 50 light-year wide view of the Carina Nebula, where new stars are being born while others die off. And uh, this last image shows a system of galaxies. The blue stream is uh, known as a cosmic fountain and contains millions of stars. Yeah, 
Einiges haben wir schon gesehen, aber mit Mick Locher möchten wir nochmal die Einzelheiten erfahren. Und zwar, Mick, wie soll dieser Einsatz genau ablaufen da oben? Also geplant sind elf Tage. Dafür wird das Space Shuttle heute Abend abheben. Die Atlantis wird dann in 600 Kilometern über dem Äquator irgendwo auf das Hubble-Teleskop stoßen, es treffen. Und dann beginnt es schon schwierig zu werden, denn aus der Ladebucht wird der Kran ausgefahren. Und mit diesem Kran muss dann dieses 13 Meter hohe Ungetüm, das ja 4 Meter Durchmesser hat, erstmal eingefangen werden. Es muss dann hier in die Ladebucht rein und hier in der Ladebucht können dann erst die Astronauten rangehen, um an diesem Teleskop zu arbeiten, damit es wieder scharf aufgestellt wird, damit es wieder gute Aufnahmen vom Weltall machen kann. Dazu wird ein Astronaut auf diesem Kranausleger arbeiten, der andere in der Ladebucht. Und sie werden über 100 verschiedene Werkzeuge dabei haben, denn es sind mindestens fünf Ausstiege geplant und die dauern jedes Mal sieben Stunden, denn der Komplex dieses Teleskops ist groß und schwierig und man muss viele, viele Handgriffe beherrschen. Die Astronauten haben dafür im Tank gearbeitet, in Houston unter Wasser, um diesen Koloss zu, äh, wieder, ja, um zu simulieren, wie er äh, repariert werden kann. Und erst wenn das geschehen ist, wird Hubble dann wieder solche Fotos machen können, hier vom Adler Nebel, der mit diesem Teleskop so durchleuchtet werden kann, dass man auch noch ganz andere Strukturen weit in den, in den Weiten des Weltalls damit feststellen kann. Aber das ist sehr sehr, sehr schwierig. Die Astronauten könnten sich an dem scharfkantigen äh, Teleskop auch verletzen und äh, man wird gespannt sein, ob alles gut geht. Zur Sicherheit steht auf jeden Fall noch ein zweites, äh, äh, ein zweites Space Shuttle zur Verfügung, das eventuell hier Hubble äh, erreichen könnte, um die jetzige Shuttle-Besatzung, die hochgeht, dann zu evakuieren. Und wenn Hubble dann wieder arbeitet, wird er Exoplaneten, erdähnliche Planeten wieder feststellen können, fotografieren können. Und er wird weitere fantastische Aufnahmen vom Weltall zu uns zur Erde zurückschicken. Mick Hubble soll ja sowieso ersetzt werden. Warum muss man da jetzt noch überhaupt dran? Naja, das Ding hat äh, bisher 13 Milliarden Dollar verschlungen und die jetzige Operation kostet eine Milliarde Dollar. Und dafür soll es mindestens noch vier Jahre halten, wenn es gut läuft, sogar zehn Jahre. Und erst dann wird, äh, wird dieses gigantische Teleskop dann wieder zum Sondermüll. Es wird wahrscheinlich nicht wieder zurückgeholt werden können auf die Erde, sondern es wird dann, wenn es ausgesetzt ist, arbeiten und irgendwann leider, leider verglühen. Vielen Dank, Mick. Ob Supernovas, Gaswolken oder schwarze Löcher, es sind Bilder von unglaublicher Schönheit, die wir Hubble verdanken. Das Weltraumteleskop umkreist unseren Planeten in 500 Kilometer Höhe seit nunmehr 19 Jahren und hat Sterne entdeckt, die 12 Milliarden Jahre alt sind. Für die Wissenschaft eine Art Zeitmaschine. Nehmen Sie Hubble und fotografieren Sie ein paar Stunden. Oh, man sieht kleine Punkte. Fotografieren Sie zehn Tage lang und Sie sehen eine Menge von Galaxien. Jede Galaxie hat 100 Milliarden Sterne, so wie die Sonne, und davon gibt es Hunderte. Also nach zehn Tagen entdecken Sie eine Welt von unglaublichem Reichtum, wo man eine Wüste vermutete, herrscht in Wirklichkeit Überbevölkerung. Doch Hubble ist ein Auslaufmodell. Trouble mit Hubble gibt es schon lange. Sogar die Hauptkamera ist nur noch bedingt einsetzbar. Mit der heutigen Reparaturmission der Raumfähre Atlantis mit sieben Astronauten an Bord wird das Teleskop zum letzten Mal auf Vordermann gebracht. In vier Jahren wird es von einem neuen ersetzt. Gelingt die Reparatur, wird das Teleskop bis zu 90 Mal besser senden. Die Fülle an Daten, die das wissenschaftliche Observatorium innerhalb der ersten sechs Monate ermitteln wird, entspricht der Menge von Daten, die Hubble in den ersten acht Jahren produziert hat. Die Reparatur gilt als gefährlich. Die NASA selbst vergleicht sie mit einer Gehirnoperation. Die Astronauten müssen mit rund 100 kleinen Schrauben hantieren. Gehen diese in der Schwerelosigkeit verloren, könnten sie in das Teleskop fliegen und großen Schaden anrichten. The Space Shuttle Atlantis is scheduled to launch in just under six hours from now. You're watching live pictures from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Astronauts plan to carry out a dangerous mission to repair the Hubble Telescope extending its lifespan by five years. Well, astronauts placed the Hubble telescope into space in 1990, and it's captured some spectacular images in the past two decades. This composite image from 2004 reveals what scientists call the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. The telescope has captured light from 13 billion years ago, when the universe was just a mere 700 million years old. Now, this image from 1995 is dubbed by NASA the Pillars of Creation. It shows the Eagle Nebula, columns of cool interstellar hydrogen gas and dust that are incubators of new stars.
And finally, this photograph from one week ago shows the planetary nebula known as Kahootek 455, named after a Czech astronomer. It was taken with the Hubble's Wide Field Planetary Camera 2, which is set to be replaced on the repair mission. Well, for more on the mission and its challenges, we're joined by veteran astronaut Jim Vegas-Kelly. He is in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Cool name you got there, Jim. Um, first of all, what exactly is the upgrade meant to achieve other than prolonging the Hubble's lifespan by five years? Well, it's actually twofold. One is prolonging the lifespan. They're replacing the gyroscopes and batteries to make sure that they can go on for quite a lot longer time and get a lot more science, but they're replacing a few instruments as well. Uh, and you've already mentioned the wide field, planet, wide field planetary camera that they're changing out. And it will uh, be about 90 times better than the original camera that was in there in 1990. So a lot more capable uh, than we were in the past. And uh, the other thing that they're doing is they're changing the power supply and a couple of existing instruments inside the Hubble as well. So uh, they're upgrading a couple and, uh, that are in there, adding one or two more, and then uh, just making sure, like you said, it could last for about uh, five, ten more years. What about the training that the astronauts would have had to go through for this mission? What can you tell us about that? Um, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, Jim, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, okay, apologies that we appear to have lost Jim Vegas Kelly, which is a real shame, because I would have loved to have heard his uh, insights on what it's like to be all the way up there. This is Shuttle Launch Control, T-minus three hours in holding, and we are at the astronaut quarters in the crew suit-up room where we see our Commander Scott Altman being fitted with his uh, helmet. And our pilot, Greg Johnson, also going through the same activities and some verifications of the uh, pressurized launch and entry suits and being assisted with his gloves. And mission specialist Michael Good. There was Steve Lindsay, our chief of the. Uh, Astronaut here at KSC. Drew Feustel. All of these crew members uh, suiting up and looking forward to uh, some very lengthy EVAs on this flight. Six and a half hours on average. Going across the room now. And that is John Grunsfeld. And he is uh, suited up with his helmet, ready to go. And we're coming over now to our mission specialist, Mike Massimino, waiting his helmet fit check. And down on the end here is our mission specialist, Megan MacArthur. And as we can see, most of the uh, activities now are well along and almost complete. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus 2 hours, 56 minutes, 30 seconds, and we see the STS-125 Atlantis astronauts now are walking down the hallway led by our commander and pilot. Here we see astronaut Steve Lindsay will be flying weather reconnaissance today. Jerry Ross, who uh, operates, runs the astronaut office here at KSC. 
And they are starting down the elevator to the astronaut transfer van. the astronauts now walking out of the astronaut quarters boarding the astronaut van. Got Altman now Climbing on board, here he comes through the hatch onto the flight deck from the uh, lower crew cabin. We're joined now here in firing room four with astronaut Janice Foss. Once, once you're on board, and as we're seeing here, they're helping them strap into their seats and things, and uh, is, is everyone very preoccupied with the activities that they have to to do to get ready for the launch at this point, or are they thinking about uh, more about what's coming up on orbit, or what's the mindset when you're getting ready to be, when you're being strapped in, getting ready to go? A little bit of all of the above. <laughs> there are duties that you have assigned that change with time, and so you're thinking ahead to make sure that you're ready for the next thing you're supposed to do. You also have a process you have to go through that includes comm checks that you need to get done in a smart fashion so you don't slow up the timeline. So right now they are very focused on just the seat stuff, but as soon as you get in your seat and they move on to the next person, then they're listening to all the communications that come in, all the ground launch sequencer stuff that's going on and trying to monitor any issues that might be arising might affect what they'll be doing next. Who are the, some of the people that are on the White Room crew that are helping you folks in? Typically you'll have one person assigned for the mid-deck strap-in and one person for the flight deck strap-in to do the mechanical strap-in part. And then you'll have a second person helping with the comm checks on the mid-deck and the flight deck. You can, s you can see, I think, two people in white you know, on the flight deck at the moment helping with the process. And there, should, there would similarly be probably two people on the mid-deck until they're done. Um, live pictures right now from the Kennedy Space Center in, Center in Florida. Uh, astronauts planning to carry out a risky mission to repair the Hubble telescope. Now, they're hoping to extend its lifespan by five years by doing these repairs. Arzane Virgi explains why this fix is so worthwhile. Pictures that take us to the edge of the universe, to faraway galaxies, a look back at time and into black holes, all snapped by the world's most famous telescope, the Hubble. But it needs to be fixed. Lift off of Space Shuttle Atlantis. Seven astronauts will blast off to do surgery in space, fixing instruments, replacing broken cameras, batteries to keep Hubble going. It's the final and most dangerous mission. Five spacewalks in five days. Astronauts could get hit by space junk, and any rescue will be tough. This glimmering jewel is nearly as big as a school bus. It circled Earth more than 100,000 times and logged almost 3 billion miles. The astronauts say it's worth risking their lives and that Hubble needs a hug to keep cosmic pictures like these beaming back to Earth. The spacewalks in this mission are going to be filmed by IMAX 3D cameras, so we'll be able to watch up close what happens up there in the spring of 2010. Zane Vergy, CNN, London. And CNN plans live coverage of the shuttle launch, scheduled to lift off from Kennedy Space Center about three hours from now. That's 2001 Central European time. Keep it right here on CNN. To lift off in just over an hour from now, astronauts will fix the Hubble Space Telescope and try to extend its life for another five, maybe even ten years. It is overdue for a tune-up, apparently. The Hubble was last visited by astronauts seven years ago. John Zarella is at the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida, with more on the mission. Hi there, John. 
Hey, Hollow. Well, everything is going well right now. The countdown for Atlantis uh, proceeding. We're in what's called a built in hold right now. Uh, liftoff coming up at uh, 2 01 Eastern time here. So, uh, less than an hour and a half from now, the astronauts are all strapped in. They're ready to go, and uh, the vehicle is operating perfectly. There are no issues here, and you're right. Uh, it's been a while since they last visited, visited Hubble, and this mission itself was, of course, in jeopardy uh, back in 2003 after the Columbia accident. Uh, NASA decided it wasn't going to do a Hubble repair mission. It was too risky, uh, and they were just going to do missions that would finish the International Space Station. But uh, by popular support and demand, the Hubble mission was put back on the book, so here we are today, and the seven-member crew is ready to go. Ala? And if they thought it was too risky a few years ago, what, uh, you know, apart from popular demand, what made them change their minds? Well, there's a big change, because Atlantis is not the only shuttle sitting on the launch pad right now. You can't see it, but off to my right, on launch pad 39B is the shuttle Endeavour. For the first time in the history of any space program, there is a rescue vehicle ready to go. Within seven days, Endeavour with a four-member crew could lift off, get up to Atlantis, and rescue the astronauts. They would perform literally a high wire act uh, using their spacesuits tethering across from Atlantis to Endeavour, and then the 11 astronauts would come home. The reason they have to have this emergency vehicle is because they're in a totally different orbit, 350 miles up, as opposed to where the space station is at 250 miles up. So the Atlantis crew could not get to the space station as a rescue, as a place to, uh, to stay until a mission could be mounted to come get them. So they have to have this contingency. Obviously, they hope they don't have to employ it but it's ready in case, uh, in case they need it. Endeavor is ready on the other launch pad. So weather-wise and the rest, other conditions were about 100% that we're going to have liftoff? Yeah, it, other than the fact that it's miserably hot here today, record <laughs> high temperature, some 95 degrees Fahrenheit out here this afternoon, but uh, it is looking really good about uh, an hour and 17 minutes or so from now. Uh, we expect Atlantis will be lifting off. Holla? All right, John Zarella, live in Florida there. Uh, for the for liftoff to go repair the Hubble Space Telescope and give us perhaps even a decade's worth of uh, stargazing. The decades-old space shuttle program is nearing its end. With only nine missions left, shuttle flights are scheduled to wrap up next year, although delays could push the final mission to 2011. The first launch was April 12, 1981, Space Shuttle Columbia. The first reusable spacecraft launching like a rocket, orbiting in space, and landing like a plane. You'll recall the two lost shuttles, the Challenger disaster in 1986 and the Columbia in 2003. But there have been 124 successful launches with more than 600 crew members. CNN plans live coverage of the shuttle launch. It's scheduled to lift off from Kennedy Space Center in just over an hour from now at 20.01 Central European time, one minute past 8 p.m. Central European time. We'll bring you that of course, live on CNN International. Let's get more on the weather conditions in Florida for the launch. Mari Ramos is at the World Weather Center. So we heard there from John Zarella Mari that it was uh, clear but hot, hot, hot. Hot, hot, hot. We were just checking. I was just on the phone right now with Kevin Corvo asking him, you know, he said it was going to be a record high today. Um, you know what? We may get close to that. It's 91 degrees right now, and uh, we could see temperatures getting warm. I don't think that's an issue as far as the launch is concerned. One of the things that they're going to be watching, Hala, though, is going to be the winds. The winds are picking up. And you heard John refer to those two shuttles. I have the picture. Isn't this cool? Um, uh, one right over here. This is the one that's going to launch today. This is Atlantis, uh, just like he said, in less than an hour and a half's time. So very exciting stuff happening. Uh, two, two shuttles on the launch pad in crystal clear skies, which is awesome. So yes, the temperature expected to rise like uh, we've been hearing, but notice that little bit of movement of cloud cover. We may see some pop of rain showers, still the possibility. That's why that's about 90% go as far as the weather's concerned, because they always have that last minute check to make sure that there aren't any convective clouds around. They want to make sure about that. Uh, it doesn't look like there will be any problems as far as the weather. The wind right now gusting to about 25 kilometers per hour, which is still within the threshold, within the limit for a go. So we're expecting it to happen. We'll uh, keep you posted, of course, and I know we're going to be carrying that live. Um, let's go ahead and move on. I want to talk to you about uh, some other storms. You can see them right over here across uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Arkansas now. Some of those might be severe later. And in the western U.S. here, the problem is that it's very, very dry. Remember, we've been talking about those fires across the area that uh, they may have been, uh, officials are saying now, started by 
people clearing for the fires by one of the power tools. It caused tremendous amount of damage. Um, the fire right now, about 70% contained. Uh, that's what we're looking at. These are called sundowner winds. But as we head through the overnight tonight and into tomorrow, those winds may start picking up again to about 50 kilometers per hour. The sundowner winds, kind of a similar situation as the Santa Ana winds, but the high is out in the Pacific Ocean and the winds come out of the north and move through the canyons as opposed to the high being back here in the Four Corners area and coming off the Santa Ana Mountains. But it's a general, generally the similar condition. Let's go ahead and carry liquid hydrogen fanula. And what they do is they, they have some buildup of ice on the outside, on the umbilical, the, a tube on the outside of that tank. So they're making sure that that's going to be okay. This part of normal procedure. So the ice buildup that uh, NASA has been talking about is not related to weather. It's related to the temperature of the liquid hydrogen that's actually used as fuel to take the shuttle out into space. So that's what's happening right now. They're expected to resume the countdown in about 30 minutes, and they are expecting uh, things to go as planned with the launch in about uh, 35 minutes from now. And this is what it looks like. Also wanted to show you because there's two shuttles right here. Um, Atlantis is this one right over here. This is the backup in case they do need to come out and rescue them from the Hubble in case there are any problems. So this... Attention on the net. This is the NTD performing the launch status checks. Verify ready to resume count and go for launch. OTC. OTC go. TBC. TBC's go. TTC. TTC is go. LPS. LPS is go. Houston flight. Houston flight is go. Myla. Go. STM. STM is go. Safety console. Safety console is go. SPE. SP is go. LRD. LRD is go. SRO. SRO is go. You have a range clear launch. And CDR. CDR and entire crew is go. And I copy that. That completes step 1122. Launch director, NTD. Launch director? Yes, sir. Our launch team is ready to proceed. We are tracking no constraints. Okay, I copy that. I'll do my poll at this time. KC Chief Processing Engineer, verify no constraints to launch. No constraints, Mike. Thank you, Steve. KC Safety and Mission Assurance. KC Safety and Mission Assurance is go. Copy. Payload Launch Manager. Mike, uh, Hubble Program and Hubble Ground Processing are go for launch. Copy that. Thank you, Bill. Range weather. Weather has no constraints for launch. Thank you, Kathy. And Ops Manager. Mike, we've cleared our issues. The MMP isn't tracking anything else. Everything looks good. You're go to launch. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Atlantis Launch Director. Hey, Atlantis, ready to copy, Launch Director. Okay, Scooter, look, it's a great day to go fly. So on behalf of the KSC Processing and Launch Team, I'd like to wish you, your crew, and the whole Hubble Space Telescope team a, a great mission. Good luck, Godspeed, and we'll see you back here in about 11 days. Well, from the whole crew, Mike, I just want to say thank you. All I can uh, really thank is that at last our launch has come along. It's been a, a long time coming. I know it took the work of the entire team across our entire agency to bring us to this point. Uh, looking back, it's been 50 years since uh, President Kennedy challenged us to do the other thing, not because it was easy, but because it was hard. Getting to this point has been challenging, but uh, your team, the whole team, everyone has pulled together. We're taking a little piece of uh, all of us into space, and at this point, all I got left to say is let's launch Atlantis. Thanks so much. Thank you, Scooter, and uh, enjoy the ride, pal. NTD, launch director, you, got that, uh, you are clear to launch Atlantis. I copy that, sir. The countdown clock will resume on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. T minus nine minutes and counting. DLS auto sequence has been initiated. The ground launch sequencer now controlling the countdown. It will monitor over a thousand parameters. PRP adjusting screen brightness across the board. Copy. ETD. Let's go for orbiter access arm recheck. Atlantis OTC, best of luck upgrading the HST to increase our knowledge for light years to come. OTC, Atlantis copies. We're looking forward to it and uh, we'll give it our best. CLS is go for orbiter APU start. PLT, perform APU start. OTC, PLT, and work. CDR, reconfigure heaters. CDR, to reconfigure work. And OTC, PLT, three good APUs. Copy.
start the orbiter aerosurface profile test. DLS is go for first sequence four. Clear caution warning memory, verify no unexpected errors. OTC, PLP, and work. A very good evening. This is Quest Means Business on CNN. I'm Adrian Finnegan in London, standing in once again for Richard Quest. And uh, an unusual start to our show today, an earlier start too, because it's just about launch time. Astronauts on the shuttle Atlantis are ready for one last flight to the Hubble Space Telescope. The six men and one woman will attempt to fix several flaws on the aging telescope. What we're going to do now is join our sister network, uh, CNN USA, for the final few seconds of the countdown of the launch itself. Enjoy. Yeah, these guys have their work cut out for them. Uh, there's uh, stuff on board that was put up there and never meant to be repaired that's broken, and uh, it wasn't meant to be repaired by six astronauts in inflatable spacesuits in space. So they've uh, trained hard, uh, they've come up with some amazing different tools to get this uh, done, and uh, over the five spacewalks, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it all progresses. Let me ask you real quick, though, now, what, what's going on right now with the, with the crew? What were you doing up there last five minutes? Okay, well, you know, there's a million things running through your mind, but basically you've trained for a long time, and these guys have been delayed and trained even longer. So you're really, you're ready to get the show on the road. You really want to get up there, you want to do a good job, and the main thing is you want to make sure everything goes as best as it can. You don't want to screw up. And uh, uh, you're thinking about a lot of things. You're, talk, you're thinking about your families, but you're just thinking about all that's going to unfold in the next 12 days, and you plan it out in your mind, and you want to make sure everything goes as close as it can to the way you trained it. You know, and Kira, this mission had been uh, planned early on, and the Columbia accident took place, and the Hubble mission was canceled. NASA wasn't going to do it. Then they brought it back by popular demand. And actually, on this mission, you got two shuttles on the pad. Yeah. Endeavor is over on pad B because if the Atlantis crew, for whatever reason, got in trouble, couldn't get back in Atlantis, you got Endeavor poised and ready to go within seven days. That's correct, John. STS-400, it's uh, the rescue mission for this mission, uh, the Hubble repair mission. And the reason that is, of course, as you talked about this before, is that they are not going to the space station. There's no, there's no safe haven, so to speak, up there. So if things were to uh, say there was a damage in the TPS system, which made it uh, impossible the tile, for the, the thermal exactly, protection system, the thermal protection system uh, that uh, they couldn't come back home or they have a problem in terms of repair, they have to launch SCS-400 and they go up there and, and have a rescue mission and bring them back that way. So, Kerry, you know, uh, it, it's interesting. You, you probably saw this. We did a piece earlier, too, on Scott Altman. Uh, who's the commander of this flight, and uh, Altman uh, actually has a movie credit to his name. He was, he's in the movie. <laughs> no one's uh, heard movie of that movie Top, Top Gun, Gun, John. No, no one's heard of that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no one's heard about that movie Top Gun. Yeah, he actually flew the F-14s as one of the pilot doubles uh, in, in that movie, Kira. That's fair, and I know we're going to talk more about that coming up. I, I, John, I want to welcome our international viewers. Uh, they are tuning in as well uh, to prepare for this launch. But, hey, while you are, are, are there talking uh, to Rick, uh, let, let's, um, let, can we get into a little more a bit of a specifics about this mission? What exactly is going to be fixed and the importance of it, what it means for us here down on Earth? Yeah, Rick, the, the importance of this mission, what it means for us down here on Earth, as Kira said, and also the fact that, the specifics of what you've got to do. There's gyroscopes that have to be replaced, and uh, there's batteries that have to be replaced, and then the upgrades and the of the cameras, and a hundred and some tiny screws on, on one of these? Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, we talked about it. I mean, some things just we weren't planned to break, so they weren't planned to be fixed. And so you can imagine how hard it is to work with tiny screws down here in the ground where you have gravity. In space, you take one of those screws out, it's gone, and you need that screw to put back the pieces when you're done. So they're going to change out some circuit boards uh, on, a, on a data unit that wasn't supposed to fill, but it did. And they're going to upgrade some cameras. And uh, Ball Aerospace and Goddard have come up with some amazing gadgetry to make this all work, including capturing screws, uh, new types of tools that have never been used before in Humble. Uh, it's uh, a very ambitious mission. But as you're saying, it, it's not easy wearing those bulky spacesuits out oh. there. And it's six and a half to seven hours at a time. Does that time go by quickly? 
You'd be amazed, you know, when you really get into an intricate work or you get really into something, how fast the time goes by. But at the same time, you know, you're looking at consumables and spacesuits, uh, you know, uh, potential problems that could stop you short in your timeline. And everything is choreographed. So if one thing doesn't go the way it's supposed to, then it's uh-oh time. And then you have to switch to what's called a breakout and go to another type of task. You know, Grunsfeld said, uh, and he was, you, you flew with Grunsfeld, right. and you did three spacewalks with him, and he's doing this mission. He said he gets into a zen mode when he's up there. And yeah. Then he's finished with the work, and he comes out, and it's like, wow, we're out here in space. That's, John, that's actually a good way of, of describing it. Yeah, you, you kind of get so absorbed in your work that you don't think about the time, you think about what you have to do, but you're not thinking about a clock. They're telling you what the time is while it's happening, but you're so well trained that you just are totally absorbed into it. You know, and Kira, we were talking that uh, they're coming down the last seven, eight shuttle missions after this one. The rest of them are all dedicated to finishing up the International Space Station, uh, then going to be moving on to what's the umbrella program is called Constellation with the Ares rocket. And right now, of course, last week, the administration asked for a review of that program. But, you know, at the same system. time, I, I think, you know, NASA still doesn't have an administrator right. waiting for a permanent okay. administrator to be uh, put into place. And, you know, and, and a lot of questions uh, to, to when uh, President Obama is going to do that, if he's going to do that. Um, John, I want to continue our conversation. We're not going to take our eyes uh, off the Kennedy uh, Space Center. Uh, sure. But on the other side of, of your screen, I just want to quickly point out that that's uh, Defense Secretary uh, Robert Gates uh, opening uh, a briefing on a change of command in Afghanistan. Uh, actually, he has not. Uh, he hasn't stepped up to the mic yet. Has this begun yet, guys, or not? Okay, no, it has not started yet. Um, we've been given about a two-minute warning. He may also talk about uh, that pretty shocking attack on a U.S. base in Baghdad today by a U.S. soldier. We're going to listen in uh, as soon as that begins. But we also don't want to leave the shuttle until it gets in uh, to space. Uh, and uh, so we are going to monitor both uh, for you right now. Okay, so while we're waiting uh, for uh, Secretary Gates, uh, John, let me get back to you on, on that issue. Right of, now, we're getting ready yeah. to go? All we're right. Going, we're going right now. Okay, Here let's listen go. in. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis. Final visit to enhance the vision of Hubble into the deepest grandeur of our universe. Bypass across the board, scooter, no action. Houston now controlling Atlantis on its way. on its way, all three engines now throttling down as the area begins, as the vehicle passes through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Atlantis, Houston, no action on the MPS H2 out. So far, so good. I, once again, we will not take our eyes off that shuttle. Uh, meantime, Secretary Gates, Joint Chiefs. Atlantis, go at throttle up. Houston, Atlantis copies, go at throttle up. Seven miles in altitude. Altitude 49,000 feet. Flight control team discussing the minor transients that were seen at liftoff. All three engines are in good shape. The vehicle is uh, headed downrange. All three hydraulic systems in good shape, as are the fuel cells. Atlantis is 18 miles uh, and altitude, downrange 23 miles. Already traveling 2,500 miles per hour, approaching staging the burnout of the twin solid rocket boosters, which have been burning fuel at a rate of about 11,000 pounds per second. Solid rocket boosters have done their job. Atlantis is uh, continuing in its due easterly course to catch up with the Hubble Space Telescope one last time. 
altitude 35 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 51 miles, altitude uh, 195,000 feet, Atlantis is traveling 3,300 miles per hour. Again, all three main engines are in good shape, as are the uh, hydraulic systems, the auxiliary power units, and the fuel cells. No issues uh, heading to orbit. Atlantis, two-engine Maroon. Houston, Atlantis copies, two-engine Maroon. Three minutes into the flight, Atlantis. Out P is a deucer only, and the ASA-1 is a power only. I don't know about you, but I never, ever tire of watching uh, those uh, shuttle launches. 3,300 miles an hour, that thing is traveling right now, just minutes after leaving the launch pad at uh, Cape Canaveral. That is the Space Shuttle Atlantis off to, uh, to catch up, as they say, uh, the key people at uh, NASA there with the Hubble Space Telescope, because, of course, that thing is hurtling around the Earth at uh, an incredible speed as well, over 300 miles uh, above the surface uh, of the Earth. Uh, Atlantis on an 11-day mission that will include five spacewalks to refurbish Hubble, which has been uh, circling the Earth for nearly two decades now. This is the, uh, the fifth and final servicing mission that, uh, that the Space Shuttle has, has made to uh, the telescope uh, Hubble. And uh, a pretty complicated mission it's going to be, uh, too. There's a lot uh, that needs to be done uh, to the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, telescope and uh, it will be uh, a much more powerful device at the end of this mission uh, than it is uh, right now. So there we're going to leave um, that live coverage of, uh, of that launch of the Space Shuttle Atlantis off on an 11-day mission to repair the Space Telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope. Amazing stuff. LH2 pressurization. Not a rocket booster. Cameras have been activated. One minute, 30 seconds. So the pressure water system has been armed. Birds observed in the immediate vicinity of the flight path. Final check of the SRB commands. SRB joint heaters being turned off. Liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen fill and drain valves are being closed. Handoff. Handoff to Atlantis has occurred from the ground launch sequencer. 20. Nozzle check of the SRBs. Firing chain is armed. Sound suppression water system armed. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1. And liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis. Final visit to enhance the vision of Hubble into the deepest grandeur of our universe. Bypass across the board, scooter, no action. Houston now controlling Atlantis on its way. on its way, all three engines now throttling down as the area begins, as the vehicle passes through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Atlantis, Houston, no action on the MPS H2 out P. Houston, we 
Atlantis, go at throttle up. Houston, Atlantis copies, go at throttle up. Seven miles in altitude. Altitude 49,000 feet. Systems in good shape, as are the fuel cells. Atlantis is 18 miles uh, and altitude, downrange 23 miles. Already traveling 2,500 miles per hour, approaching staging the burnout of the twin solid rocket boosters, which have been burning fuel at a rate of about 11,000 pounds per second. Rocket boosters have done their job. Atlantis is uh, continuing in its due easterly course to catch up with the Hubble Space Telescope one last time. Altitude 35 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 51 miles. Altitude uh, 195,000 feet. Atlantis is traveling 3,300 miles per hour. Again, all three main engines are in good shape as are the uh, hydraulic systems, the auxiliary power units, and the fuel cells. No issues uh, heading to orbit. Atlantis, two engine Maroon. Houston, Atlantis copies, two engine Maroon. Three minutes into the flight, Atlantis. The AC2 out P is a deucer only, and the ASA 1 is a power only. Copy, ASA 1 power only. Approaching four minutes into the flight. Altitude 310,000 feet, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Houston, copy, negative return. And for Ray J, you can disregard MPS H2 out P on the left. Copy, uh, box, disregard MP MPS out P on the left. That call. Atlantis, press to ATO. Houston, Atlantis copies. Press to ATO. Those calls indicate that Atlantis can reach orbit on two engines should one fail. Again, all three are in good shape. The calls that you're hearing are related to a bad transducer only. The systems are in good shape. Atlantis is 208 miles away from the Kennedy Space Center. The vehicle can no longer return to the Kennedy Space Center in the event that there is some systems problems, but again, uh, all the systems are in good shape, approaching five minutes into the flight. Atlantis is 65 miles uh, in altitude, traveling uh, almost 6,500 miles per hour now, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 246 miles. Again, all systems in good shape. The only uh, issues were a bad transducer, so the crew is told to disregard that. They're getting cues from all of the other Atlantis systems on board. Houston, Atlantis, copy. Five minutes, 20 seconds into the flight, Atlantis can reach a safe orbit on two engines now, but again, all three are in good shape. Atlantis, single engine, Ops 3. Houston, copy, single engine, Ops 3. Atlantis, single engine Banjul 104. 
50, single engine banjo 104. Uh, that call indicating that uh, Atlantis could reach Banjul and the Gambia, although that is not a transoceanic abort landing site. Atlantis, negative Maroon, select Banjul. Houston, we copy. Negative Maroon, selecting Banjul. Vehicle rolling to uh, heads up now to get good communications through the tracking and data relay satellite system. Six minutes, 25 seconds into the flight. Downrange from the launch site, 4,030 miles. Altitude, 353,000 feet, or about 67 miles. Press 109. Houston, we copy. Single engine press 109. Your shutdown plan is nominal. You are go for the plus X and go for the pitch. Houston, we copy. Nominal shutdown. Go plus X. Go pitch. A call indicates that Atlantis can reach orbit on one engine should two fail. Again, all three are in good shape. Approaching seven minutes into the flight, the plus X is a maneuver that's conducted after the vehicle uh, separates from the external fuel tank. These views uh, from the camera on the uh, feed line on the external fuel tank looking up at Atlantis. We'll lose that view uh, here in about uh, a minute or so. Atlantis, the deucer is going to toggle, no action. Again, re referring to the faulty transducer, uh, no action required by the crew. All systems in good shape. The three engines are now beginning to uh, uh, throttle back uh, as it uh, prepares to uh, pass through three times gravity to maintain that on the structural uh, vehicle. And Atlantis is just about to move out of range of the Merritt Island tracking station ground site. We expect to lose the view from the uh, feed line camera as uh, the vehicle uh, approaches uh, the point of main engine cutoff here in just a few seconds. Main engine cutoff has been confirmed. Atlantis now uh, in orbit, uh, beginning its uh, chase to catch up with the Hubble Space Telescope. Atlantis Houston, nominal Miko, Ohms 1 is not required. Houston, we switch copy, nominal Miko, Ohms 1 not required. Our countdown clock to resume at 1752 and 56 seconds, step 1088. CLS copy, we have a pending resume set for 17. Go, go, go for launch, GNC. Go, guidance. Go, Fido. Go, prop. Go, GNC. Go, Max. That. Go, Eagle. Go, Ecom. Go, FAO. Go, payloads. Go, and for the customer. Go, DPS. We're go. Inco. Go, booster. Go, surgeon. Go, PDRS. Go, okay. And let's see, we'll wait on GNC, but I uh, was holding no constraints. And guidance, we cleared all of our dollar constraints. From a weather standpoint, we're okay. observing no forecast. Uh, constraints to launch. No constraints, Mike. Thank you, Steve. KC safety and mission assurance. FCO, I hear you loud and clear. Five by. Tell me. Have you loud and clear as well. Thank you, sir. T minus nine minutes and counting. CLS auto sequence has been initiated. Uh, 
this is what we practice a lot for. So uh, we're getting into our comfort zone here. So keep focused and um, sing out if you have any anomalies. Recorders are running. One minute. CLS is go for auto sequence start. 25. 20. 15. All pins open. 10. Copy this. CLS is go for main engine start. Liftoff confirmed. Copy liftoff. Houston, we had a small program with the FCS channel. GT. It's A side, it's bypass, no action for the crew. Bypass across the board, no action. Bypass across the board, scooter, no action. Copy, bypass across the board. Flight guidance, good roll maneuver. Copy, Copy good roll. 94. Copy, two stage. GNC, anything else going on? No flight, just ASA, one power. Okay, copy that. Keep an eye on it. We'll go. Throttle down, three at 72. Copy in the bucket and the LP. Crew can disregard that flight. Okay, no action on the H2 LP. Atlantis, Houston, no action on the MPS H2 LP. Houston, copy, no action. Throttle up, three at 104. Go at throttle up. Atlantis, go at throttle up. Boosters, the three FIDs are all invalid, invalid family and delimiter. You can ignore them. Crew has no insight. Okay, and the H2 out P. I saw two hits in that deucer. I can't tell if it's the deucer itself or the channelization coming back for it. It is healthy now. The engine is at 104. All three engines are good. Okay, and if that uh, is a real telemetry problem, impacts? It, it would impact the crew calling an engine out behind the data path. It's one of their cues. It is not feeding the red lines in any way, shape, or form. Okay, copy that. Taking some hits here, GC, on PDL. On PDL. Let's see, GNC, uh, everything else looks good as far as FCS. Yeah, flight, everything else looks good. Copy that. Copy staging. 103 converge. Copy. Atlantis, negative return. Recently copy, negative return. Negative return. And for Ray J, you can disregard MPS H2 out P on the left. Press ATO. Copy, uh, box, disregard MP, MPS out P on the left. Atlantis, press to ATO. Houston, Atlantis, copy. Press to ATO. Rolling heads up. Copy. Negative Maroon, select Banjul. Atlantis, negative Maroon, select Banjul. Houston, copy. Negative Maroon, selecting Banjul. Let's see, booster shutdown plan. Nominal shutdown plan. Okay, nominal shutdown prop and guidance plus X and pitch. Props go for both. Caps can curse. Okay. Single engine press 109. Atlantis, single engine press 109. Houston, we copy single engine press 109. Your shutdown plan is nominal. You are go for the plus X and go for the pitch. We're going to get it again? Yeah, we're right on the caution and warning limit here at this point. Okay. Tell them it's going to toggle, no action. Atlantis, the deucer's going to toggle, no action. 3G throttling on three looked good. Okay, copy that. Tag still a good booster. A firm. On dangerous. One 
23K. Copy, 23K. Miko, Miko confirmed. Copy, Miko. Looks like we almost hit it right on there, Fido. Nominal Miko, Fly Domes 1 is not required. Raum für Atlantis ist am Abend vom Weltraumbahnhof Cape Canaveral ins All gestartet. Die sieben Astronauten an Bord haben eine schwierige Mission vor sich. Die Crew soll das Weltraumteleskop Hubble reparieren und technisch aufmögeln. Der Start verlief reibungslos. Die fünf Arbeitseinsätze dort bei Hubble sind insgesamt geplant und Ziel ist es, das Teleskop so gut in Schuss zu bringen, dass es mindestens bis zum Jahr 2014 wieder einsatzfähig ist und auch bleibt. Astronauts to the Hubble Space Telescope to repair it and install new cameras. Well, on the line from Miami is our correspondent uh, Andy Gallagher. Blast off, Andy went without a hitch, but it's a pretty risky operation, this one, isn't it? It is. I have to say it's probably one of the most ambitious and dangerous over the past few years. They're going to be up in space for 11 days. They're going to carry out five seven-hour spacewalks, all with the aim of repairing the Hubble telescope, that almost 20-year-old uh, instrument that's one of the most important to science. Now, if everything goes as planned, they will replace some of the gyroscopes and batteries and put two new cameras in. And NASA say it should extend the life of the Hubble telescope between five and ten years, but they will be operating in a, in a part of the orbit where there is a lot more danger. The shuttlecraft won't be able to go to the International Space Station if it gets in trouble, and there's also a great deal of space debris up there, so the chances of collision are a lot higher. And as the astronauts walk towards Atlantis, getting prepared for blast off, of course, they will have seen the reserve shuttle uh, on the runway waiting to pick them up if it all goes wrong. Yeah, that's pretty, uh, pretty unprecedented to have another shuttle there waiting if things go wrong because, of course, the way NASA has been operating over the last few missions is that if anything does go wrong, they can go to the International Space Station. The astronauts can get off and go on to the safety of the International Space Station. They haven't got that backup on this mission, so there is another shuttle sitting on the ground at Cape Canaveral here in Florida waiting just in case they need to launch a rescue operation. Okay, Andy Gallagher. Dank Hubble sehen wir den Weltraum heute mit anderen Augen. Doch im Laufe der Zeit hat Hubbles Sehkraft deutlich nachgelassen und auch sonst zwickt und zwackt es. Kurzum, Hubble ist nicht mehr der Jüngste. Die Amerikaner sprechen sogar vom Hubble Trouble. Aber jetzt naht Hilfe. Sieben Astronauten sind heute Abend mit der Raumfähre Atlantis gestartet, um das altersschwache Teleskop wieder aufzumöbeln. Eine Operation im offenen Weltraum sozusagen, die durchaus gefährlich ist. Hildegard Wert berichtet. Die Atlantis ist auf dem Weg zu einer der spannendsten Missionen in der Geschichte des Space Shuttles und zu einer der gefährlichsten. Sie soll weit höher hinauffliegen als sonst bis an die Grenze ihrer Reichweite. Ihr Ziel ist das Hubble-Weltraumteleskop. In 600 Kilometern Höhe dreht es seine Runden und es schickt immer wieder sensationelle Bilder zur Erde. Hubble ist zum unentbehrlichen Instrument für Astronomen in aller Welt geworden. Aber nach 19 Jahren Dauerbetrieb ist allerhand kaputt und eine Reparatur dringend nötig. Unterwegs macht eine Trümmerwolke der NASA Sorgen. Dort, wo die Atlantis hinfliegt, ist die Erdumlaufbahn besonders zugemüllt. Zum ersten Mal in der Geschichte der Raumfahrt steht deshalb ein zweites Shuttle als Rettungsraumschiff bereit. Wenn alles gut geht, wird Hubble übermorgen mit dem Roboterarm eingefangen und in der Ladebucht festgemacht. Fünfmal wird dann der Reparaturtrupp in den freien Weltraum aussteigen. Auf dem Programm steht eine komplette Runderneuerung, frische Batterien an neuer Computer und hochmoderne wissenschaftliche Geräte. Sie werden den Forschern einen ganz neuen Blick ins Universum ermöglichen. Es ist die fünfte und letzte Reparatur, damit das gute alte Hubble noch ein paar Jahre fit bleibt. Jedes Mal, wenn wir Astronauten da hochgeschickt haben, war das Teleskop wieder wie neu und sogar besser als zuvor. Mit geschärftem Blick kann Hubble dann die Rätsel des Kosmos studieren. Geheimnisvolle Phänomene wie schwarze Löcher. Heute wissen wir, unser Sonnensystem ist nur eines von Milliarden, allein in der Milchstraße. Und auch die Milchstraße selbst ist nur eine unter unzähligen Galaxien. 
Noch immer sucht die Wissenschaft nach den verborgenen Kräften, die das alles antreiben. Und nach einer Antwort auf die Frage, ob es irgendwo da draußen Leben gibt. Date the universe to 13.7 billion years. They discovered that just about every galaxy has a black hole. They've discovered something that's called uh, dark energy, which makes up 75% of the universe, but nobody knows what it is. So uh, Hubble has really been pressing the envelope as far as stars and planets and, uh, uh, and galaxies. And they really do expect that with all of these new upgrades, as one of the, the former astronauts told me, he said, you know, if you took Hubble from when it first launched after, to where it is today, it's a thousand times better instrument for detecting things in deep space than it ever was. So they really do expect that if they can get things fixed up there, that there are going to be some wonderful new discoveries ahead during the next five to ten years. Holla? All right, John Zarella, thanks very much for that. He's live in Florida there with more on these efforts to repair or upgrade or keep operational the Hubble telescope, per perhaps even for up to a decade. Atlantis is to einer schwierigen Mission ins All gestartet. Sieben Astronauten sollen das Weltraumteleskop Hubble reparieren. Dazu sind fünf Außeneinsätze geplant. Übermorgen soll das tonnenschwere Teleskop mit Hilfe eines Roboterarms der Atlantis in die Ladebucht der Raumfähre gehievt werden. Von der Rundumerneuerung verspricht sich die NASA, dass Hubble bis 2014 spektakuläre Bilder zur Erde schicken kann. Pünktlich um 20.01 Uhr mitteleuropäischer Zeit hob die Raumfähre von Cape Canaveral in Florida ab. Ziel der elftägigen Mission ist es, das Weltraumteleskop Hubble zu reparieren und technisch wieder aufzumöbeln. Dazu sind fünf Arbeitseinsätze im Freien geplant. Das Observatorium soll so mindestens bis zum Jahr 2014 einsatzfähig bleiben. Kommen Sie morgen. Fünfmal wurde denn auch dieser Reparatureinsatz verschoben. Jetzt immerhin sind die Motöre auf dem Weg. Nur die Rechnung möchte man nicht sehen, jedenfalls nicht, wenn der Anfahrtsweg mit draufsteht. Christoph Reukerath sagt, was Sache ist. Ein fröhlicher Trupp Optiker ist das, der sich dagegen Mittag im Kennedy Space Center in Florida auf den Weg zur Arbeit macht. Doch die sieben Astronauten haben eine schwere Mission vor sich. Die Raumfähre Atlantis soll sie direkt neben das Weltraumteleskop Hubble bringen. Und das ist nicht ganz ungefährlich. Der Start um genau eine Minute nach 14 Uhr Ortszeit ist da fast noch die leichteste Aufgabe. Er verläuft nach Plan. Spektakulär wie eh und je bei bestem Wetter. Doch oben könnte es schwieriger werden, denn die Gegend, in der das Hubble-Teleskop seine Runden um die Erde dreht, ist nicht gerade die beste. Die NASA hat ausgerechnet, dass eine recht hohe Chance besteht, dass das Space Shuttle mit Weltraumschrott kollidiert. Bei Einsätzen am Hubble-Teleskop, hier Bilder einer vorhergehenden Mission, besteht ein erhöhtes Risiko für Mensch und Gerät. Und deshalb steht unten ein weiteres Shuttle startbereit. Die Raumfähre Endeavour soll im Notfall hinterherfliegen, um die Astronauten zu retten, falls die Atlantis beschädigt wird. In den nächsten fünf Tagen sollen sie das Teleskop General überholen, nicht nur reparieren, sondern verbessern, mit neuen Kameras und besseren Sensoren. Seit bald 20 Jahren zieht das Teleskop am Himmel seine Bahnen. Hubble hat uns die Lehrbücher der Astronomie neu schreiben lassen. Diese ganzen neuen Entdeckungen, dunkle Materie, die Entstehung des Universums, wie das genau war, das sind alles Sachen, von denen wir in der Uni nichts gehört haben. Wir müssen uns langsam fragen, ob unsere Doktortitel noch gelten. Denn die Bücher, mit denen wir studiert haben, sind dank Hubble total überholt. Die Atlantis rast weiter in Richtung Hubble, wirft ihre Zusatzraketen und den Treibstofftank ab, wird leichter und schneller. Wenn die Mission erfolgreich verläuft, soll Hubble weitere fünf Jahre arbeiten können und mit seinen faszinierenden Bildern Astronomen und Öffentlichkeit verzaubern. Und Shuttles Start klein, Cape Canaveral, aus gutem Grund. Denn die Atlantis hob am Abend zu einer riskanten Mission ab. Sie soll das Weltraumteleskop Hubble reparieren. Und das kreist in einer Umlaufbahn, in der eine Kollision mit Weltraumschrott zumindest möglich ist. Doch die internationale Raumstation wäre im Notfall unerreichbar weit weg. Also hat die NASA eine Rettungsraumfähre bereitgestellt. Eine teure Angelegenheit. Björn Heckmann über den ungewöhnlichen Shuttle-Auflauf. 
So hatte sich die NASA einst den Fließbandbetrieb ins All vorgestellt. Dicht nebeneinander stehen gleich zwei Raumfähren, beide zum Start bereit. Doch das Gedränge in Cape Canaveral ist Teil eines Notfallplans. Denn während die Atlantis am Abend planmäßig abhebt, dient die Endeavour vor allem als mögliches Rettungsschiff. Man hätte sonst diesen Flug nicht gemacht. Man hat gesagt, wir brauchen diesen zweiten Shuttle. Und dieses Shuttle ist in der Lage, bei einem Problem, bei einem großen Problem mit dem Shuttle, äh, in der Lage, dann innerhalb von sieben Tagen zu starten und die Besatzung des verunglückten Shuttles zu retten. Ohne diese Vorbereitung würde es Wochen dauern, ein zweites Shuttle zu starten. Die Hilfe käme im Notfall viel zu spät. Und im Gegensatz zu anderen Flügen könnte die Crew diesmal nicht an Bord der Raumstation auf Hilfe warten. Das ist eben jetzt bei dem Flug zum Hubble nicht der Fall. Das heißt, wenn dort etwas passiert und äh, der Shuttle nicht mehr zurück kann, dann sind, ist die Besatzung und auch der Shuttle verloren. Dieser heikle Flug der Atlantis ist in jeder Hinsicht historisch. Zum letzten Mal startet ein Shuttle zu einem Ziel abseits der Raumstation. Zum letzten Mal werden Astronauten das Weltraumteleskop Hubble reparieren. Denn das sieht nicht mehr richtig scharf und braucht neue Kameras, Steuergeräte und Batterien. Wenn bei dieser Reparatur alles klappt wie geplant, dann haben wir ein Teleskop mit den besten Instrumenten aller Zeiten. Die Zukunft liegt noch vor Hubble, auch wenn es schon eine glorreiche Vergangenheit hinter sich hat. Seit 1990 hat Hubble mehr als 4 Milliarden Kilometer zurückgelegt und dabei unzählige Bilder von fernen Galaxien und bislang unbekannten Himmelskörpern zur Erde gefunkt. Und damit das noch fünf Jahre funktioniert, gibt die NASA etwa 500 Millionen Dollar für den Shuttleflug und rund 300 Millionen für die Ersatzteile aus. Das ist das wert, denn wenn man sich überlegt, was das Hubble Space Teleskop uns in den vergangenen Jahren äh, für dolle Bilder und für dolle Fakten geliefert hat, gerade auch was äh, die Entstehung unseres Universums anbelangt, dann ist das kein rausgeworfenes Geld. Bevor Hubble bei fünf Außeneinsätzen rund erneuert wird, untersuchen die Astronauten aber erst einmal die Atlantis auf mögliche Schäden. Mit einem Roboterarm werden sie vor allem den bei der Landung lebenswichtigen Hitzeschutzschild begutachten. Denn wenn der nicht mehr intakt ist, müssten sie sich schnellstens um ihre eigene Rettung kümmern und nicht mehr um die von Hubble. Good afternoon and welcome to the post-launch news conference for Space Shuttle Atlantis' STS-125 mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. Joining us here today to discuss the launch is Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Bill Gerstmeyer. Good afternoon. Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, Ed Weiler. Mission Management Team Chairman, Mike Moses. And Space Shuttle Launch Director, Mike Leinbach. Good afternoon. We'll start with opening remar remarks from each of the panelists, and we'll take questions. Mr. Christmeyer. Thanks, John. I mean, it's a great to be here. It was a, a great launch, a real tribute to the teams that uh, worked to, so hard to get this vehicle ready to go fly. Uh, they've done just a great job of that, taking that first step, and I think that's sometimes the hardest step, in a way, to, to get to orbit. But I need to stress that this is a really challenging mission with the five EVAs to go repair the telescope, and we need to really stay focused on that mission. But the team here at KSC gave us a great vehicle. The ascent was good. Um, Michael talked to you a little bit about some of the stuff we saw. Uh, the tank looked very good from the performance standpoint in the external tank. It looked really good. So we got a great vehicle. This is a great start to a very challenging mission, and we'll see how the mission unfolds throughout the next couple of days. So again, thanks to the team here and the folks around the country that got this vehicle ready to go fly and did a great job of giving us a good vehicle on orbit. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Ed? Thanks, Gerst. Uh, I have very little to say. This is my sixth uh, Hubble launch here at the Cape. Uh, once again, thank, thanks to the shuttle program, the people at the Cape made this launch possible. But as Gers said, this is just the beginning. We've got five EVAs. We'll be doing some routine things, but we're also going to be trying some things that have never been done before. But the astronauts have trained for hours and hours and hours in the water tank, and I have full confidence that they'll pull off, pull off a success. And if they do, we'll have a Hubble for at least five, six, eight years more. So uh, we're looking forward to the next uh, seven or eight days. Thanks. Well, folks, uh, good afternoon. We had a, a really good launch today. Um, I can't I can't begin to tell you how, how proud I am of this team. You know, you guys got to see the, the end product, which was the launch, but but sitting and watching how the team worked, it was absolutely evident that uh, 
that all the lessons we've learned and all the, the, the skills and practice we've had since return to flight have really paid off today. This, uh, this team worked through some issues, nothing really big today, but, but enough that kind of came right on top of each other that, that really showed that the team knows where their expertise is, they know how to go do it, and they can do it in a, in a very efficient way and communicate those answers up the chain very quickly. Um, you know, we had a couple things. Uh, Michael talked to you some of the details about uh, some ice and frost in an area that we weren't quite expecting. We had some weather issues that we were working late. Um, and, and the combination of that kind of coming on top of each other really showed uh, the maturity of the team. Again, I, I can't begin to say how proud I am. Um, it kind of started this morning when we were talking the weather. Um, I'll have to give credit to Angie Brewer and Jim Taylor, the, the folks who put the integrated flow together that let us be able to move the launch date up a day. If we were here tomorrow talking to you, I don't think we'd be talking about a good launch because the weather's not looking very good tomorrow. So uh, we planned well <laughs> two weeks ago when we, we moved the weather along with us when we moved our launch date. So I'm real happy about that. Those teams did an amazing job getting us to the pad and ready to go. Let's see, in count, we talked a little bit. Um, we had uh, weather at Marone, our uh, TAL site was uh, initially forecast no-go and observed no-go. There was a, a front basically right near the, uh, the field causing some, some low ceiling clouds and some rain. The teams worked through that. The, uh, the radar assets we have on site there aren't as good as the ones we have here locally. And so we basically were kind of hanging on until we got our weather observer up in the aircraft and let him go fly the area and see what we had. And then as time developed, we got in closer. We saw that, uh, that we were really not too worried about that. It was, it was very high level precipitation that ended up dissipating on us. And so pretty early actually, uh, almost an hour and a half before launch, we got uh, observed go and forecast go for Marone, which kind of took that tell site and, and put it in our back pocket and we were happy there. Um, while we were talking, um, the cumulus clouds were building up around the pad, uh, which is a, is a worry for us for launch constraints. Um, and so we had the uh, STA out flying through the clouds trying to measure the tops of those cloud heights. Um, we were getting close, but then they, again, they started to raise and dissipate on us, uh, and so it turned out to be no issue. But again, a really good point of communication that we had that weather team really on top of things, both in Europe and here locally, uh, to make sure we understood our constraints and knew, knew that we were good to go. Um, there was a, uh, a couple, of, uh, couple of issues when we, when we got through and lifted off. Um, right away off the pad, we had a uh, ASA-1, which is a, a flight control feedback system, controls the aerosurfaces, all the TVCs. It's one of four systems, and it failed. Um, looking at it, it looks like the power failed to, to that unit and, and took it down. Again, it's one of four, so it was no issue. Um, it bypassed itself. Um, the crew's going to leave it alone for now while the teams look at it. Uh, we, we don't need it again until entry, obviously. Um, so we'll do a thorough data review to find out what really happened to that box and whether we think we can go reset it or not. But again, there's no real rush. There's no impact to, to that box being down. The other nuisance was a uh, on the left main engine, there was a, a hydrogen uh, pre H2 out pressure, basically, um, that was flashing um, transient. It kind of changed its signature on us. When it tripped the limit, it rang an alarm on board, and I think it did that two or three times on the way uphill. Again, it's just a transient inducer. It's there for awareness. It didn't feed into any software. It wasn't part of any control loop. Um, so no impact at all to the main engines or their performance. In fact, uh, it's a cue that the crew would use as one of many cues if they had an engine out and there were other failures that, that took their prime cues away from them. Uh, and to be honest, at that point in your, in your profile, your prime cue that you've lost an engine is the fact that, that a 30 year thrust just went away and you probably feel that in the seat of your pants. So, so really it was no impact again other than just the alarms going off and, and the team in, in Houston did a really good job of telling the crew that was no issue and to just ignore that. Um, you could hear the chatter on their loops as they made sure they understood it really truly was no issue and, and let the crew not have to talk about it. Um, that's it. We had uphill, like, like Bill said, the, uh, the debris looked really good. Uh, nothing of note really there at all, but we'll let the teams do all the right things and go off and talk and review all the data. We'll inspect the vehicle in the next several days to make sure we came out of ascent clean. Um, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Mike. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Well, the countdown was really, really clean. Um, this is the first time before external tank loading that, that I can recall that we went to the mission management team and said, we're not working any issues at all. Let us go tank. And that's what they did. And the, and the count was extremely clean until we got to that little bit of issue with the ice. And uh, at first, we weren't sure whether the ice was, was uh, go or no go. And so we asked the uh, final inspection team to go back out to the pad and, and take some more pictures of it. And we asked them to do that uh, because the ice was detected back in the control room with pictures that they had taken previously and downloaded through our computer system from the launch pad to the control room. And so the guys did a great job in the control room and really looking at, that, at those details on the pictures. And then uh, we asked the final inspection team, a subset of them, to go back out and take some more pictures. Uh, when they downloaded those pictures back to the fire room, it looked like the ice was deteriorating a little bit. It was melting, as you might expect on a day like this. 
And so the team did a really, really good job of quickly dispositioning that problem. At one point, I recall asking them to take about 10 or 15 minutes to go talk about it, and we'll regroup. I sensed that we were kind of maybe rushing through that problem a bit. And so I asked the team to, uh, to again, take about 10 or 15 minutes and, and go talk about it. And, and from a uh, systems engineering and integration perspective, an orbiter perspective, an external tank, and the RSRB and RSRM, they all did that in an extremely ex expeditious manner and came back uh, when we asked them to at the bottom of the hour. And, and all, all systems cleared. We were ready to go. And uh, the ice posed no problem to us at all. So while at first we weren't sure whether that was going to be an issue, it, it turned out not to be at all. And uh, we had a beautiful liftoff. And I can tell you, Team Atlantis is, is really, really happy right now to have her on orbit. And uh, really glad we could take uh, the Hubble pa Space Telescope uh, components back up for your, for your servicing missions. So uh, great day here at the Kennedy Space Center. Thanks. Thank you. We'll now take questions here at Kennedy Space Center, followed by our NASA Field Centers. Uh, there's a lot of people in the room. So if you could just keep it to one question initially, and we'll see if we can come back around for follow-up. Questions? James Dean, in the back. Wait for the microphone, please. One second. Wait for the microphone. Thanks, man. James Dean from Florida today. Um, Dr. Weiler, now that the, the flight is in orbit, are you more uh, relieved that the mission is up and in progress or nervous about what's ahead on the spacewalks? Uh, having had a lot of experience with shuttle missions and uh, Mars missions, uh, I've, I've become quite sanguine about these things. I'll be relieved when I'm on the uh, shuttle landing strip and greeting the astronauts coming back from a successful mission. That's when I will measure success. Uh, Pat Duggins, WMFE, uh, probably for Dr. Weiler. I, I'm, I'm assuming you all are expecting a, a normal mission and everything's going to get done. But if you had to pick between a restored ACS or a restored STIS, <laughs> <laughs> Which one would it be and why? Uh, my bias as a person who got his Ph.D. doing spectroscopy, of course, is a STIS. But I'm also a realist, recognizing that an awful lot of science comes out of cameras, and certainly it's the cameras that produce an awful lot of interest, public interest, and most importantly, interest among our school kids. Uh, I'd have to lean a little bit to the ACS. But regretfully, the ACS is also the tougher one to repair. So, uh, but I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everybody that we have never tried to repair an instrument like this in one of these EVAs. Putting in new instruments is, is bad enough, but it's more or less routine. But taking things apart and putting in circuit boards uh, when you're an astronaut wearing gloves, it's, uh, it's a little dicey. So uh, we'll take our best shot, but let's all remember these instruments are dead right now. If they don't get fixed, we haven't lost anything. So we can only be on the plus side on these two repairs. We're going to try our best. The astronauts have trained as much as they can. And uh, I think we've got a good shot at it. Uh, Mike Schneider, Associated Press. Question for Mike Leinbach. I was wondering if you saw any debris at all, and if so, how soon after liftoff, and where did it come from? Let's see. I think, Gers, did you check the yeah, quick look? I, I watched a video, and we saw a little bit around uh, SRB SEP, two things, and they could have been things actually in the SRB plume. Those were small. They're after the... Uh, aerodynamic sensitive transport time and then there were two other items that were like 339 and four minutes into flight again very late very low velocity didn't appear to impact the orbiter or not a constraint or concern for us at all so we saw those things and they're they're very minor from what we've seen we also got to see a pretty good look at the bottom of the orbiter if you watched the video from the tank and the bottom of the orbiter also looked really good at first first check and it, and as Mike said Mike Moses said we'll We'll go through this period of time, and the crew will do some inspection today, looking at the nose cap of the orbiter, and then tomorrow we'll do some more detailed inspections, and that'll be the kind of the indications. But the tank, for all intents and purposes, performed exactly the way it should have performed. Thank you. Uh, Tarek Malik with Space.com and Space News for Dr. Weiler. Um, you, you, you mentioned yesterday this flight was supposed to fly in 2002, then it was delayed and canceled, and then reinstated, and then delayed again. Um, so I'm just curious you know, to you personally, when you watch the shuttle, lo you know, launch off the pad and, and get into orbit, uh, you know, what were you feeling? How do you feel now? And maybe how does your team feel? Uh, I guess the one word that comes is bittersweet. As I said, I've been here for six launches, Hubble launches, one of them counting the initial launch in 1990. Uh, Hubble, for those of us who've been on it for decades, uh, is a roller coaster. You know, there was a lot of hype down here, and everybody was excited in 1990. Uh, we launched it, made the front page of every paper in the world, and then two months later, we're at the bottom of Death Valley with sphere collaboration. 
Uh, that's a big drop from Mount Everest to Death Valley in two months. Uh, but that's where we were. But we promised in 1990 would fix it and just give us three years. Nobody believed us, but the team at uh, you know Goddard, Marshall, the Institute, uh, Kennedy, Johnson pulled together and we pulled it off. And uh, then 2002, we're supposed to have the last servicing mission and it got canceled after Columbia. But then a robotic servicing mission got approved and then got canceled again. Uh, again, the roller coaster. And then Mike Griffin gave us one more shot to prove that we could do this safely. And uh, we convinced Mike, the team convinced Mike it was safe to go ahead. And uh, so here we are. So uh, I'm uh, happy to see the launch, but it's sad knowing it's the last shuttle repair mission for the Hubble Space Telescope. But I'm, I'm looking forward to a successful repair and yet five, six, seven more years of Hubble. And hopefully we can overlap with uh, the Jim James Webb Space Telescope that it should be launched in uh, 2014 and uh, space astronomy will continue. There, there will be life after Hubble. Questions? Over here. <laughs> Uh, Greg Dobbs with HDNet Television. I guess, Bill, this is for you. I assume that you all have a high level of confidence that you won't have to execute a rescue mission with Endeavor, but when will you have completed the analysis of the data to confirm that confidence? Again, it kind of comes in pieces as we go through the mission. You know, we'll do a little bit of inspection today, and we'll do some more inspection, uh, I guess, the next day uh, on orbit. And then finally, when we actually separate, we'll do the final uh, uh, inspection of the shuttle after we separate from the telescope. So after we've done all the telescope repairs and we're done, we do an orbit adjust maneuver. And as we do that orbit adjust maneuver, right after that, we do the final inspection to see if any damage occurred to the orbiter during that time. And then at that point, we would essentially clear Endeavor, and Endeavor would be no longer required to be ready in a standby position. So it kind of goes throughout the mission as a period of time. But again, we've got extremely good performance. We'll, we'll see how things go throughout the mission. The focus is really needs to be on the Hubble mission and the servicing and the EVAs. And, and get through those, and, and the vehicle will be there to support that activity, and, and we'll, we'll see how it works out. But that's the general plan as we go through the mission. Randy Siegel, WSTU Radio. Just kind of a follow-up for, uh, for Mike Lambach. How long do you, do you need for the pad as far as making the change go? And uh, are we still looking at uh, June 13th, assuming we have a very successful mission here? Well, I assume you're asking about the, the pad turnaround. Um, we're going to expedite our inspection of Pad A. It'll start tonight after the launch and uh, look at it again tomorrow. Normally we wait for the next day. We do a lot of wash downs, et cetera. This time we want to get a, a quick inspection of the pad done to see if there's any damage to the pad that may be a constraint to launching off Pad B. We also go out there and look for any, any type of uh, flight hardware which may be there, which we've never found, by the way, but we always go look for that. And so we're expediting that tonight. And uh, we should have a, a good idea tomorrow afternoon or may maybe the next day how Pad A fared. Um, then we start, right, we start right away working on Endeavor over at Pad B. We'll start the ordnance installation tomorrow. And uh, assuming we don't need the, the rescue mission, we roll Endeavor from Pad B to Pad A on May 29th. And that sets us up for the 13th, which is still our launch date for STS-127. Sure. Over here. Jackie Goddard for the Times and the Scotsman. Um, sometimes it's a question for Ed Weiler. Sometimes it can be difficult for the public to understand sometimes what NASA does and why it's doing it and how it translates to them. Could you just sum up a little about why Hubble has been so important and uh, what it's achieved for astronomy and what's at stake if those repairs don't manage to get carried out? Wow. That's a, I'm not sure I can remember all that, but... Uh, uh, for astronomy, it's clear what Hubble has done. I mean, uh, I uh, told a story. To, I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, reminiscing over 35 years. Uh, I like to think that if, if the average American knows about one scientific project or one scientific program, just one, what might it be of all the stuff that's out there? I'll bet you it's Hubble. I have direct experience of that. Uh, you know, you go on an airplane, if I wear my Hubble project jacket, uh, you know, I've got a guaranteed conversation all the way across country, whether I want it or not. Uh, people, people, name, Hubble is, the, rec the name recognition is there. Now, 
it's clear in science uh, Hubble has made its mark. I mean, it's not an overstatement. You've heard the statement many times from many administration administrators or directors, uh, something's going to rewrite the textbooks. Well, I can tell you it's true. Hubble has rewritten astronomy textbooks. In fact, I was talking to my, uh, my senior project scientist, David Crone, reminiscing one day at a press conference saying, you know, we keep talking about all these new discoveries Hubble has made, uh, you know, helped to discover dark energy, uh, showed us the universe got its act together much earlier in producing galaxies, things that we weren't taught in graduate school, and I wonder if our PhDs are still relevant at this point. You know, maybe we need to go back because the textbooks that we used have been rewritten. So has Hubble had an impact on astronomy? Absolutely. Now, to explain why it's had the impact on the public is a different story. You might want to ask the public, but uh, I think uh, being an astronomer is fun because it's one of the few sciences where the average American can, or average anybody, any citizen of the Earth, has some feel for astronomy because they can go out on a dark night and see astronomy. They see stars. They see the moon. They see planets. That's hard to do if you've, you're explaining microbiology. You know, the average uh, person can't really conceive of what's going on there. And, uh, you know, there is this thing called science fiction. The TVs are filled with Star Treks and Star Wars and all that stuff. And, uh, frankly, it's ironic when you watch some episodes of a certain show like Star Trek, you see Hubble pictures in the background. So we've even become an icon for science fiction. You know, you'd have to ask the public, why is that? But I, I think it's because astronomy touches people. It's a science they can, they can understand, they can feel. You know, we're, we're, we're showing them pictures of their backyard, you know. Admittedly, the backyard's pretty big, almost infinite, but uh, it, it's their backyard. It's our environment. And I don't know if I've hit all your questions, but I can't talk too long. These people want to go home. Yeah. Is there another question over here? <laughs> right here. Uh, Matt Phillips with the Lake Orion Review. Um, with the five EVAs that are scheduled, uh, they're very robust with how much they're doing in the time period that they're uh, going to be out, out of the shuttle. And I think it's an average of about six and a half hours per EVA. How much additional time would they have, say something takes a little bit longer to do, how much additional time would they have capability-wise with their suits and with their gear to stay out? You want to answer that, Mike? Yeah, let's see. Um, you know, we kind of have as a rule of thumb, we plan to six and a half hours EVAs. Um, the actual duration that the crew can stay out is a, is a moving target based on the consumables that they have in their suit, the battery power, the CO2 scrubbing, the O2. Um, some of those things we can top off. Uh, by going back into the airlock and recharging some we can't um, and so the six and a half hours is the is the planning guideline you don't want to ever plan an eva that goes longer than that um, but the reality is we'll probably have more capacity than that now the, the trick comes in how do you use that extra capacity and and again our rule of thumb and our planning guidelines tell us that you wouldn't go beyond that six and a half hours unless you had something that that you needed to finish up that configuration so that you stayed in a safe config overnight um, a task that just needs five or ten more minutes we would finish a task that needs another three hours, we obviously wouldn't even start. And, and so the team's got the priorities all laid out. They practice this very well. Um, there's a whole set of flight rules that document uh, each individual parts. And the, uh, the individual flight directors and lead EVA officers and payload officers from the Hubble team really know those specifics. One good thing about the Hubble team is, is when you're doing a, on a station EVA, some of the tasks we're doing, we've practiced, but we haven't practiced that exact task. It's more of a skill set that we've done. The Hubble team has done everything so many times. They kind of know. So when we're at a certain point, you got a real good feel for how much longer it is going to take you. So it gives you some confidence. But um, I would say in general, we're not going to go violating in the six and a half hours, but it's certainly not a, at six and a half. You put your tools down and you come on in. Bill. Hey, it's uh, Bill Harwood, CBS, with two quick ones, one for Mike Moses and one for Mike Leinbach. Uh, for the first, Mike, uh, the enunciator and the, uh, the circuit breaker, those are the only two issues. There was nothing else associated with any of that on the ascent, and, and that's it, right? And Let's see. The, uh, yeah, the ASA, uh, I don't know if uh, circuit breaker, it's an RPC, which is a circuit breaker in, in most worlds. We call them RPCs. Um, so, yeah, we think that was a power trip. That was the only thing we had there. And then the enunciation on the, the helium pressure transducer, I'm sorry, the hydrogen, I keep calling it helium. It was an H2 pressure transducer on the left main engine. That was just a inducer that, that went flaky. Those were the only two indications we saw. Zero concerns at this point. Yeah, zero Thanks. concerns. And Mike, what's next for Endeavor? Just for the record, could you refresh us uh, how far you take Endeavor down and where you stop and wait for guidance at that point? Thanks. Yeah, the, the first thing we do with Endeavor um, tomorrow morning is start our ordnance operations. We're going to get ordnance put on the ship the same way we do for every, every uh, mission about four or five days away from launch. Uh, we have a decision to make about pressurizing the high, the high pressure gas bottles, the MPS and the, and the hypergolic bottles. That decision comes in about two days. 
Um, and if we decide to, to take that action, then we'll be about three days away from launch, which puts us right at, right at the beginning of launch countdown. So we'll start burning that work down with the idea of, of telling the program we're going to be about three days away from being able to launch Endeavor, and then they'll tell us whether to proceed on and get in the count or not. And that same timeline will happen over an expanded timeline if there's no immediate concern based on the early review of, the, of, the, of Atlantis. Then we'll kind of take that work a little bit more slowly, but nevertheless, in about five or six days, we'll still be three days away from launch. Um, so that at any time, if they tell us that we've got damage on Atlantis, we'll be able to pull the, pull the trigger and, and go launch Endeavor. Go ahead over here. Yes, uh, Stefano Coludano <coughs> uh, for Rai Italy State uh, Radio and Television. Um, it takes uh, eight and a half minutes to uh, place Atlantis into orbit uh, to the space station, and it takes just the same time to get up to the Hubble altitude. Um, how do you do that? Could you explain that in, in simple terms, <laughs> if possible? Thank you. It's an orbital me mechanic question, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to make me stretch my orbital mechanics. Um, we use the, uh, the main engines. You know, in orbital parameters, we talk about a, an apogee and a perigee, the, the highest point of the orbit and the lowest point of the orbit. Obviously, uh, when we lift off, we're kind of down here on the Earth. So we use the main engines to shape that trajectory. So a normal space station mission, I think, um, and here's where I'm going to stretch, puts us in an apogee of about 175 nautical miles, and then our, our perigee is kind of low. We use ohms 2 to, to make that up and circularize it. And that's all relative, depending on where we want to we want to stay lower than the station to phase up to catch to it. We're doing the same thing with Hubble. So we're basically sitting right now in a very elliptical orbit. Our, our apogee is way up high. The, the main engines put us in a very high apogee, but our perigee is very low. So OMS-2 will catch us up, and, and the OMS-2 burns, and the, the following rendezvous burns will slowly change the trajectory. So we really use the orbital capability in orbit to get us there as well. So it's a combination of main engine trajectory and orbital burns that we do after the fact. Without actually sitting here and talking <laughs> to you about the mechanics behind it, it's, it is kind of hard to explain. I'm, I haven't found a good way to do that one. I'll have I to go think practice. the simplest way is we're injecting into the same type of transfer orbit. So even though Hubble is at a higher altitude and a different inclination, we're still going to use the same technique to catch up. So yeah. we, we inject into a delta altitude below Hubble, just like we inject to a delta altitude below space station. And then we set the launch time based on how much we can catch up with that delta altitude. So we're effectively inserting into the same orbit, except we're going to use phasing to catch up over the number of days, and that sets when the launch window is. Pat Duggins again, WMFE and NPR, either for Mr. Gersten Meyer or Mr. Moses or whoever would like it. Uh, no indications of problems on Atlantis in terms of damage now, but say if tomorrow something showed up during OBSS ops, would you press ahead with the rendezvous and the, and the repairs while you evaluated or call everything off? Or how, would, how would you handle that? Again, I think our approach is going to be we're going to continue on with the rendezvous and keep moving in that direction and just continue to evaluate. So. It's like everything. We, we take the data we get, we evaluate the data we got, and then we make the assessments of where we are, and we'll continue pressing towards the Hubble mission, and that's our objective, and, and see where we are as we evaluate. So yeah, and the, the other thing is, is we really, this is not that much different than any other mission to us. We have the same capabilities, the same analysis tools. It's just that our rescue time is shorter than it would normally be. So we, we've got Endeavor sitting on the pad ready to go, as opposed to back in the OPF waiting to come out on a rescue. But the, the decision-making process, the assessing of damage uh, that you've had, whether it's repairable, the success of that repair, the risk of reentry for that repair, that's the same risk trades that we do all the time uh, with station missions. So we're just going to apply that same process as we go. Um, and so if something comes in that flags right away that we know it's, it's critical damage, we'll take one branch of the path. If it's, if it's something that needs more assessment, we'll go down a different branch. You've kind of seen that in the past when we've had smaller things that we know we're going to clear for entry, like a frayed blanket. We just don't know if we maybe have to go tack it down at some point or not. So for those things, we press right on ahead. So it's the same thing. Like I said uh, in the press conference today, we've kind of been training for this all along. This is uh, just kind of apply our, our techniques and tools to, to the Hubble mission instead of a station mission. And I, th I think Mike made a very important point, is we've really been training this exact decision process with every one of our station flights. The only piece is the rescue flight has to be a little bit earlier, and we need to be prepared for Endeavor on the ground. But all the other decision process, all the other analysis, all the teams that look at the data in Houston, they've been practicing that for every station flight all along. James? James Dean from Florida today. I'm just wondering what the what the timing uh, is of the, uh, the point at which you'll be able to clear Atlantis at least until late inspection, and is that within just a few days when, Mr. Linebacker, you mentioned you have a decision point for the Endeavor processing? 
Yeah, see, flight day three, uh, before the crew goes to bed on flight day three, we'll have all the data down. Um, and the goal there is for the team to be able to know whether we need to go do any follow-up focused inspections with the boom. Um, just like any mission, if, if a focused inspection is something we plan on, the sensors that we have can clear damage. But if the, if the guys see something, to go get a really crystal clear picture of what damage is there, we'll take the arm out and use some of the higher power sensors that don't do good in a scan mode but do really good when they're stopped and staring at damage. We'll take those out for a special dedicated look. We budget time to do that, but we kind of... We don't want to just have dead space in the timeline if we don't need to do it, so we kind of plan for success. We, we fill that time in, but we know how we'll pull stuff back out of it. So for this mission, um, with the, it's a little unique in that there's a MFR uh, uh, a foot restraint that goes on the end of the shuttle arm that the crews use while they're working on Hubble. Um, we'd have to take that off to go grab OBSS to pull it out to do one of those focus inspections. So before we get to the EVA, there we, we would do that. We want to know long-winded way of saying by the night the crew goes to bed on flight day three we want to know do we have to change the plan for the next day on flight day four's EVA uh, basically at the end of that EVA they would pull the uh, the foot restraint off so by the end of flight day three we'll have focus inspection that'll be our first real cut at what's the severity of what we have is there something we need to go look at or not so that'll be kind of the hint that I plan on using with these guys down here to say whether we should press ahead and pressurize COPVs or or we don't have any focus inspection candidates we'll still process but we can start to slow down a little bit so that's the main decision for the first first hurdle. Okay, over here. Jim Siegel, I'm with the Celebration Independent newspaper. Could one of you comment a little bit more on the icing problem that you mentioned briefly at the beginning of this session and exactly where was that and why could it have been a problem? Well, exactly where it was is, is on the, the uh, left side of the orbiter where the umbilical, um, we, we fill the orbiter's hydro uh, hydrogen through the left-hand umbilical. There's power and data and other systems that go through that umbilical. And that's a T0 disconnect, right? When the SRBs ignite is when that, that umbilical comes off. Uh, the ice was built up right around the periphery of that, of that system, probably a little seal issue. Um, and, and the ice was, pr the, the moisture was probably coming from the inside out. It was a very, very dry day out there. And um, again, it would have been an issue had it gotten any larger and, and had it been a concern during liftoff, if that had, piece of ice had stayed on the orbiter and then eventually had come off during flight. And so we convinced ourselves that it, that it was either going to come off right at T0, which I think it did, or it was so small that even if it came off during flight, it wasn't going to pose a problem to us. James Dean in the back. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Gerson, I just wondered if you could comment on the, on the importance of the launch to uh, allowing you to turn over pad B for Ares 1X. Yeah, again, I think, the, I think the importance of the launch is we're going to go actually work on the Hubble's telescope and get it repaired, and, and that's the <laughs> excitement of what we're doing. I think it's a unique uh, experience that we get to go work on the Hubble and do a different type of EVA than we've done with the station teams and the station flights. And I think the chance for the orbiter to get to go up and figure out a way that this team can pull all this off and get these five EVA scheduled is really the focus. And, and again, like I've talked before, we kind of take these flights one at a time. And, and this one's a little special for us in the fact that it is a chance to see the human and robotic teams work together in, in a new, unique way to actually really repair this telescope. And we want to really be focused 100 percent on doing as best we can for the Hubble team and leaving the telescope in the absolute best configuration we can so they can get the world-class observations they've had in the past and they can continue into the future. Are there any other questions? There's one way in the back here. Thank you. Ken Kramer for Space Flight Magazine and the Planetary Society. I'm, I'm wondering, um, could astronauts in an Orion capsule do some of the uh, repairs like changing out the batteries or the uh, gyroscopes? Again, I think if you take a look at the cargo bay of the shuttle and you look at how packed full of equipment it is, uh, I think it would be tough to carry that much cargo in the, in the back part of an Orion or Ares. Uh, could they do some of the tasks? I think they could. You know, they could definitely potentially dock. You know, we're going to put a ring on the back of Hubble that, that will allow for other uh, devices to come up and dock to it in the future. So there's some capability there. But I think if you look at all the equipment that the shuttle is carrying, the fact it has the airlock, it can carry the seven crew members, it has the robotic arm to go do these activities, the Hubble or the, the space shuttle is really uniquely serviced. Is, 
uniquely set for the servicing task. So the, the ability of the shuttle to do this is a truly unique vehicle. There's not many vehicles that have the cargo carrying capability, the airlock, the ability to transport that many workers to the scene to go do the EVAs. And so I think it can do some of those activities, the new vehicles can, but it sure can't to the level that you're going to see on this flight. Someone here in the front. Randy Siegel, WSTU. Gers, it seems that we're doing a, quite a bit to make sure we don't leave any orbital debris up there in that particular orbit, bringing everything back with us. Is that part of the concern that we have, is that we're going to cut down on this orbital debris as much as humanly possible? I think we're generally careful when we do EVAs that we don't deploy anything unnecessarily, or if we do, we'll analyze it. In the case of station, you know, we've dropped off several components, but we know they have a finite lifetime. They're going to reenter fairly quickly and not be part of the debris problem. So I think in general, everything is tethered. We're very careful that we don't lose anything, and the crews are trained to, to watch all those. Uh, you can also see it. You also, in, inside the telescope, you clearly don't want to get any kind of debris or contamination in there. If you look at the task to replace the card, they've built a very intricate device that holds all those screws, those 100 mm -hmm. screws that they're going to back out, that keeps all those captured so they don't become a debris concern. So just like on the ground, we're very cautious about debris and contamination in our hardware. It's the same, same kind of thing on orbit. Uh, Greg Dobbs again with HDNet Television, probably for Mike. Assuming a successful mission, assuming then the movement of Endeavor from B to A, when do you begin the conversion of B? Well, well, we'll start right away. I mean, the, the Constellation folks have, have work plans all set up, ready to go. Um, as you know, we've, we've finished off quite a few of those in the downtime as we were, we were processing Endeavor. Leading up to the processing of Endeavor, we were able to do quite a bit of work out there. But essentially, the day we roll off of Pad B, we're going to turn it over to the Constellation folks and, and let them have at it. Um, there will be no more need for it from a shuttle perspective. We'll cannibalize some of the equipment that we want to keep as spares, but after that, uh, we're done. And they're going to use the launch pad B for Ares 1-X, so that's, that's where we started the modifications, yeah. and we'll just continue on with those modifications. You know, they put, we put some brackets on the side of the fixed support structure that we will then add the uh, wind stabilization equipment. That'll be some of the work that we'll start doing out at pad B to get ready for Ares 1-X. So as soon as, as, soon as we're, we roll the vehicle off of pad B, then it's time for the Ares team to start working on Ares 1-X. Okay. Any other questions here at Kenny Space Center? Okay, well, that will conclude our news conference. For more information on Space Shuttle Atlantis' STS-125 mission and to learn about the mission, please go to www.nasa.gov slash shuttle. Thank you for joining us. And this is a replay of a video shot on board Atlantis earlier this afternoon of the external tank uh, after separation. This video uh, shot through the uh, flight deck windows, the aft flight deck. The first uh, views of Atlantis's uh, payload bay, the uh, airlock in the uh, foreground uh, from which the uh, five back-to-back -back spacewalks will be conducted. Uh, just behind that, uh, looking aft, uh, you see the super lightweight interchangeable carrier that uh, houses the new wide field camera uh, that will be installed uh, on the telescope. Uh, out of view behind that is the orbital replacement unit carrier, and then uh, all the way at the back end of the payload bay is the flight support system. Uh, another rack of uh, change-out hardware for the telescope uh, housed on the multi-use logistics equipment carrier in the very back of the payload bay along the... Uh, left side on the right in this view as the uh, left hand door comes open is the shuttle's robotic arm the uh, remote manipulator system 
will uh, be used extensively throughout the flight. Uh, its first opportunity uh, will be uh, during a checkout a little bit later uh, on the first day of the flight. And then throughout the second day of the flight, it will, uh, you, it will grapple the, um, the extension boom, the orbiter boom sensor system you see on the, uh, along the right side of the payload bay and in the, on the left in this view that will be used to do an extensive survey of all of the uh, uh, thermal protection system, the tiles and the uh, reinforced carbon-carbon wing leading edge panels and nose cap, as well as some uh, additional views uh, back near the tail of the orbiter on either side, the orbital maneuvering system pods. The robotic arm uh, throughout uh, the mission will be uh, operated uh, most extensively by Megan MacArthur as she's serving as the uh, flight engineer and the lead robotics officer for the mission. This is from a camera at the uh, forward port side of the payload bay right behind the crew cabin looking aft along the uh, length of the uh, space shuttle's robotic arm. We're seeing the uh, the middle joint and then off to the end and the uh, cameras located uh, at that m elbow as well as uh, out at the hand. And there uh, see the view of the uh, far end of the uh, robotic arm released from uh, from its from being uh, restrained at the end. Soon uh, there, the same happening with the uh, elbow of the robotic arm and uh, it's being raised from the shoulder by mission specialist Megan MacArthur. As is always the case on orbit, a dramatic sunrise, which improves our view into the uh, end effector of Atlantis's robotic arm. This is a view from the camera at the aft end of the payload bay on the port side, uh, tilted up, looking into the, uh, the business end of the uh, robotic arm as Mission specialists Megan MacArthur and Mike Massimino prepare to begin the uh, survey of the uh, payload bay and the uh, various systems located in the payload bay for this Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission, including the flight support system, the uh, platform upon which Hubble will be uh, berthed, and the, uh, the several racks which are bringing up the new equipment and will bring home the old equipment those include the super lightweight interchangeable carrier, the orbital replacement unit carrier, and the multi-use logistic equipment carrier. The survey of the payload bay will also uh, take a look at the uh, other items standard inside the uh, shuttle payload bay, including the uh, tool uh, support assemblies, which are uh, either side of the uh, airlock which uh, in this case is uh, out in the payload bay of the shuttle as well. This upcoming survey of Atlantis's crew cabin is uh, part of the uh, flight plan on this flight because there is no uh, rendezvous pitch maneuver imagery available as there has been on each previous space shuttle flight since the loss of Columbia on all of those rendezvous with the International Space Station. Uh, shuttle commanders have uh, flown up to a distance of some 600 feet below the International Space Station and then performed a head over tail backflip to expose the underside of the uh, shuttle to the uh, cameras wielded by Space Station crew members shooting uh, with uh, high-powered lenses through the windows 
in the uh, Earth-facing side of the space station back in the uh, Zvezda module. Since this flight is not going to the International Space Station, there will be no uh, RPM uh, pictures available. So uh, the current survey will be conducted uh, in daylight. Today's crew cabin survey designed to look for any indications of uh, damage that might have been suffered on any areas of the orbiter during its ride to orbit this afternoon. This data, this imagery, will be combined with uh, that already captured by cameras on the ground, as well as uh, other data still on board Atlantis still to be downlinked to the ground, including the uh, imagery from the uh, umbilical well camera of the external tank after its separation, and likewise a video from a camera on the external tank itself looking at the uh, underside of the shuttle, plus data gathered by the uh, sensors in the leading edges of the uh, shuttle's wings. All of that information, along with that to be gathered tomorrow during a uh, survey using the uh, orbiter boom sensor system with its uh, cameras and uh, laser imagers, will be uh, scrutinized by the specialists here at the Johnson Space Center in Houston looking for uh, any evidence of any damage to the uh, shuttle's thermal protection system. Mission Specialist good, Mike Massimino. In the area of the controls of the uh, robot arm. You too, Bueno. And John. Oh, there he is. Commander Scott Altman appearing in that window on the left with a wave to the camera. Houston, stop recording. Copy. Now in the window at the bottom of the screen, Mission Specialist Drew Feustel getting a look at the camera. Drew, uh, we see you. Looking good. And now the uh, robotic arm continues to move aft. We're uh, moving across the top of the uh, external airlock, the uh, hatch uh, facing aft, uh, just in the lower right-hand portion of our screen, is the hatch through which the spacewalkers will uh, exit for the uh, five spacewalks coming up starting Thursday. And the uh, orange Colored apparatus is the uh, super lightweight interchangeable carrier. The camera's now moved uh, outside of the sill and looking down in the radiator in the inside of the uh, port payload bay door. Now in the view, the uh, leading edge of the uh, port wing. Now beyond the leading edge, as the camera begins to uh, move back toward the uh, body of the shuttle, this time uh, focusing on those reinforced carbon-carbon panels along the uh, shuttle's port wing. 